welcome our first panel of witnesses and ask you to take your places behind your nameplate on the witness table. Remain standing until we have you sworn in. Our first panel includes Dr. Jacqueline Derrick Forrest, Vice President for Research at the Allen Guttmacher Institute, Dr. Jerry Holka, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of North Carolina, and Dr. David Grimes, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Southern California, and former Chief of the Abortion Surveillance Branch at the United States Centers for Disease Control. Now, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate that each of the witnesses has responded in the affirmative. Please sit down. Thank you very much. Before we begin, let me thank all of you for taking time from your very busy schedules to be with us today. And we'll ask each of you to testify, and we will then have questions when all of you have completed your prepared testimony. And Dr. Forrest, if it's all right, we'll begin with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The microphones are not particularly strong, so if you'll pull it as close to you as possible, that would be helpful, I think. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, and I think if you raise it just a little bit. That's it. Good. And uh, How's that? We're set. Okay. Thank you. I'm Jacqueline Derrick Forrest, Vice President for Research at the Allen Guttmacher Institute. The Institute is an independent, private, nonprofit corporation for research, policy analysis, and public education in matters related to reproductive health. Thank you and the committee for this opportunity to discuss abortion and its impact on women's health today. I met with Surgeon General Koop and his staff several times in the course of their research review. I provided them with extensive information about how much better things could be if American women had access to more effective methods of contraception, thus reducing the need for abortion in the United States. I also shared with them, however, the truth about how things really are now presenting data showing how common abortion is, a description of the kinds of women who have abortions, and the reasons they themselves give for choosing abortion. As we know, abortion has been around for a very long time, regardless of the state of the law. It is neither a new phenomenon nor a rare one, with 1.6 million abortions occurring annually. Abortion is so common, as you stated in the introduction, because unintended pregnancy is so prevalent in the United States. Over half of all pregnancies in the United States each year are unintended, and half of those end in abortion. This means that one quarter of all pregnancies in this country end in abortion. Next to circumcision, abortion is the most common surgical procedure in America. Countless American women obtained illegal abortions before the 1970s. We've estimated that legal abortions have been obtained by 16 million American women. The Institute conducted a survey recently to find out something more about who these women are. We looked at a wide range of characteristics, including, among others, age, income, race, religion, current employment status, marital status, and intention about future childbearing. Not surprisingly, we found that the most disadvantaged in our society have the highest rates of abortion. Black and Hispanic women and women who are poor or depend on Medicaid are disproportionately represented among abortion patients. So are unmarried teenagers and young women and women who are separated or divorced. Women who say they practice no religion have a higher abortion rate than those women who do. And among those who do express a religious affiliation, abortion rates are higher among Roman Catholic women than among Protestant women or Jewish women. One of the main reasons for differences in abortion rates is the disparity in rates of unintended pregnancy experienced among these different groups of women. In general, a woman who is young, unmarried, non-white, Hispanic, or poor is at greater risk of an unintended pregnancy and an abortion because she is less likely to be using contraception or to be using it successfully. What is striking about the reasons that women give for deciding to have an abortion when they are unintentionally pregnant is the degree to which those reasons seem to match their social and economic conditions. Although these women on a whole say that they plan to have a child or children later in their lives, they evidently do want to do so when they are in an economic position to provide for their children, when their relationship with the children's father is stable, and when they feel emotionally mature enough to raise a child. They want to finish school and attain some job security. 
It is also important that we remember, Mr. Chairman, that some abortions occur to women who very much wanted to become pregnant and have a child. For them, the emergence of a personal or fetal health problem can lead them to seek an abortion. Certainly, the psychological impact of abortion in these cases could be expected to be different from those where the pregnancy was unintended. I have talked about the most typical abortion patients and the most often given reasons for having abortions, but I should point out that abortions occur to women of all ages and all social classes. They happen for as many different reasons as there are women to tell of their own situations. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I would remind us that once a woman has reached the often painful decision to have an abortion, acting on that decision itself can involve another round of difficulties. She may not have enough money, she may have to spend time trying to find a doctor or a clinic who performs abortions, and that provider may be far from where she lives. All of these factors can result and do result in delay obtaining abortions. Then, after surmounting these obstacles, she may well have to walk through a gauntlet of protesters screaming that she's a murderer, waving placards in her face, and copying down her license plate number when she enters the clinic. Some questions in research are as yet unanswered especially those as to how we can better prevent unintended pregnancies. But as a researcher who has worked in this field for almost 20 years, I can assure you and the American people that there exists a great deal of useful, high-quality research about abortion. We do know a lot that could be of help to you and others in guiding policy decisions that you need to make now without waiting for a non-existent moment in the future when all the science that could be done has been done. While I wish that Dr. Koop and his staff had issued a full report on their research review, I do want to commend them for undertaking the project in a very professional manner. And I want to wholeheartedly support Dr. Koop's strong recommendation that we work together to drastically decrease the need for abortion by better preventing unintended pregnancies. And finally, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your longstanding concern about this issue and many others relating to the health of women and for your commitment to seeing that the American people truly receive all the facts about an issue that touches so many of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Forrest. Dr. Hulka, we'll prepare for your testimony. Good morning. I'm Dr. Jerry Hulka, a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the medical school and professor of maternal and child health at the public health school in the University of North Carolina. Before 1967, I was in training and practice in New York City and Pittsburgh. Complications of illegal abortion were so common that a septic ward was set aside for the infections. Surgery for hemorrhage was a common night duty. When I was asked to present the complications of legal abortion to the Surgeon General, I organized a literature review around the following question. Why did the United States legalize abortions? A summary of the 68 reprints I gave him uh, has been provided to you. Briefly, in the 1960s, a new safe method of abortion by vacuum aspiration spread throughout Europe and England. Dramatic reductions in European mortality and morbidity from legal abortions convinced us American gynecologists, those of us who have to manage these complications, that legalization would do the same in our country. For these preventive reasons, obstetricians and gynecologists were active in making legal abortions, in, uh, abortions legal in the 60s. Legalization did have dramatic effect on American women's health. Deaths from illegal abortion dropped from 300 prior to 1960 to actually no deaths in, from le uh, le illegal abortion in 1979. Death is the ultimate health disaster, clearly defined and recorded in our vital health statistics. Disasters less defined and recorded are hemorrhages, infections, and emergency hysterectomies with subsequent infertility and pelvic pain from the damage caused by septic illegal abortions. These disasters were deeply heartfelt by every gynecologist who lived through that era. The relative safety of abortion can be seen by comparing it to delivery. The black bars are delivery and the white is abortion rates in the United States. Have, uh, having a pregnancy go to term now carries with it uh, seven to ten times the risk of death from uh, having a legal abortion. 
The medical sequelae of legal abortion was also exhaustively studied. This graph summarizes multiple studies of the question as analyzed by the Center for Disease Control. No increase of reproductive problems after legal abortions. Conclusions above the line are increased risk, below the line are decreased risk for mid-trimester abortion, short pregnancy is measured in months, and prematurity is measured in grams. Although physicians are proud of this major prevention of reproductive damage, I can also tell you that no one, including myself, likes to do abortions. I wish Congress could pass a law that would eliminate abortions, but this is just wishful thinking. Abortions have been universal in human reproducing society since recorded time, regardless of whether they are forbidden by law or religion. Let me document this for you from my state. In 1968, a unique study documenting illegal abortions in North Carolina was done. These are compared to legal abortions, the white bars, from our most recent vital health statistics. The total abortions done when they were illegal and legal has changed very little. One out of four pregnancies ends in induced abortion. This was true before legalization, it is true now. Regardless of what Congress or the Supreme Court decide this year, it will be true next year. There will be over a million abortions in the United States annually. The unavoidable question before us as providers of health care is, how are we going to manage over a million abortions in the United States annually? If we restrict legal abortions to medical indications only, another question is created. Who shall decide if a woman can have a safe legal abortion? Having the doctor make this decision places him in a godlike role which society and most doctors reject. Forming committees of physicians and clergy creates agonizing dilemmas of which woman shall and which woman shall not. As a physician, having had to make these decisions in the 1960s, I would like to state clearly that I believe the person most qualified and competent to decide on the appropriateness of abortion in any specific situation is the woman herself. What are the medical consequences of severely restricting abortions? Romania did just that in 1966. The birth rate doubled. As septic abor illegal abortions were reintroduced, the birth rate declined, maternal mortality rose. The rate of prematurity uh, with accompanying severe birth defects almost doubled when abortions were withheld from high-risk pregnancies. What costs will be added to our health care system for the management of illegal abortions? In countries like Panama, where abortions by, are banned by both law and the church, for every 10 obstetrical beds, there are two beds for severe complications, 19% uh, versus 81% beds. These are expensive beds for triple antibiotics, transfusions, and surgery. When I presented these medical facts to our Surgeon General, he asked one good question. What can we do to reduce abortions in our country? We lead the developed world in teenage pregnancy and abortion. Our sensible neighbors to the north and Canada have half the teenage pregnancies and abortions we do. In summary, uh, I do believe as a physician that we need research to develop effective programs to prevent abortion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hawkins. Dr. Grimes? Good morning. My name is David Grimes. I am professor of obstetrics and gynecology and preventive medicine at the University of Southern California School of Medicine in Los Angeles. Before assuming this position, I served over nine years as a commissioned officer in the U.S. Public Health Service. I was assigned to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. In the early 1980s, I served as chief of the abortion surveillance branch at CDC. In that capacity, I was the principal federal health officer responsible for evaluating the safety of <coughs> induced abortion in the United States. 
The medical evidence concerning the safety of induced abortion in the United States is clear and incontrovertible. Because of its controversial nature, induced abortion has been intensively and extensively studied over the years. As a result, today we know more about the safety of abortion than about any operation ever practiced in the history of medicine. I will first discuss the adequacy of existing data and then summarize several key findings. Surgeon General C. Everett Koop reported to President Reagan in his January 9, 1989 letter that, and I quote, for the physical situation, data have been gathered on some women after abortions, end of quote. Actually, the federal government has collected and analyzed detailed individual case reports on over 160,000 women who underwent induced abortions in the United States between 1971 and 1978. I believe this is the largest such study in the world, and it led to important publications in the medical literature. In addition, since 1972, the federal government has been identifying, investigating, and analyzing every abortion-related death in the United States. This active surveillance system now encompasses more than 20 million induced abortions and has been shown to be much more sensitive in identifying such deaths than our traditional vital statistics. These two complementary federal studies on the safety of abortion provide information that is unparalleled in scope and in detail. The legalization of abortion profoundly improved public health in the United States. The shift from illegal to legal abortion nearly eliminated deaths from illegal abortion in this country. In the early 1940s, more than 1,000 women died each year in this country from abortion complications. As you've heard from Dr. Hulka, in 1979, intensive nationwide surveillance identified not a single death from illegal abortion among over 50 million women of reproductive age. Since the legalization of abortion nationwide in 1973, the risk of death from abortion has decreased more than five-fold to a level now less than one death per 100,000 procedures, which is less than the risk of death from an injection of penicillin. Trends in abortion complications have also paralleled trends in abortion mortality. Hospitalizations of women with abortion complications decreased across America as safe legal abortions replaced unsafe clandestine abortions. As you've also heard, legal abortion has not been found to impair a woman's ability to have children in the future. However, no health care practice should be evaluated in a vacuum. One must always examine the alternatives. In general, the risk of death from pregnancy and childbirth is about seven times higher than that from induced abortion, and the likelihood of suffering complications is much higher as well. For example, the likelihood of requiring major abdominal surgery to manage complications is about 100 times higher for childbirth than for abortion. When the Surgeon General was preparing the abortion report requested by President Reagan, I met with him, showed him a series of photographic slides, and gave him copies of many scientific publications concerning abortion safety. For him to conclude that, and I quote, scientific studies do not provide conclusive data about the health effects of abortion, end of quote, is puzzling especially when much of that research was done by the United States Public Health Service, which he directs. In conclusion, a vast literature documents that legal abortion has improved public health in the United States. Legalization of abortion has led to declines in deaths and complications related to abortion. Abortion is far safer than giving birth. When abortion became safe and legal, the health of the nation improved. If abortion were to become unsafe, and illegal once again, as occurred in Romania in the 1960s, the health of the nation would suffer. In contrast to Dr. Koop's assertion, it is easy to separate the health effects of abortion from the hotly debated social issues that surround it. One need only to examine the federal government's own data. That evidence confirms that the physical health effects of abortion are both thoroughly documented and highly favorable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Grimes.
I'm pleased to note that we've been joined by another distinguished member of the subcommittee, Mr. Peter Smith. Smith, do you have a, any opening comment you'd care to make? No. Uh, as I indicated, we will try to limit questions from members of the subcommittee. Uh, we'll start with uh, 10 minutes that there'll be a, an opportunity for a flow of questions for each member, and then if necessary, we'll come back for a second round. Uh, we need not take 10 minutes, but we'll, we'll, we'll have 10 minutes permissible. Uh, Dr. Forrest, in the Surgeon General's report, he states that earlier abortions are safer than later ones. If a woman decides she wants an abortion, are there obstacles that cause delays before she can get the abortion? Well, yes, there are. Even in the United States today, women who live in almost three-quarters of the counties in the U.S. have no abortion provider accessible to them in that county, so that if they, they seek an abortion, they have to go outside their county, sometimes even outside their own state, to find a provider. That can certainly increase the length of time it takes and the difficulty they have obtaining services. In an article published last year, um, it was estimated that almost half of the women who had late abortions reported that the operation was delayed because of lack of money. In cities or towns where abortion is not available, would the need to travel pose an additional financial burden causing delays in the procedure? Yes. A study that we did at the Institute found that about half of women having late abortions were delayed because of problems making arrangements, primarily difficulties getting money. And that is a greater problem if someone needs to travel because obviously expenses increase. And we see then that those women who are most disadvantaged have fewer economic resources, often than are delayed in having abortions. In the testimony that we've heard this morning, it seemed clear that making abortion illegal does not prevent abortions, but only prevents legal abortions. If the goal were to prevent abortions by preventing unwanted pregnancies, what one or two federal initiatives would be most effective? Well, preventing the unintended pregnancy is, should be our goal, and increasing federal support for research to develop new contraceptive methods to improve the contraceptive methods that are available today certainly should improve their use. The other is that we need increased research and programs focused on helping people correctly use contraceptives and avoid unintended pregnancies. We have looked at countries in Canada and Western Europe where they have good accessibility of abortion services. They have much lower rates of abortion because they have better contraceptive use. We need more and better research on the methods and we need to get to work on the programs and kind of research efforts that will help the American people become better contraceptive users. Thank you. Dr. Halka, as a consultant providing information to the Surgeon General, you gave Dr. Koop a notebook entitled Why Abortion Was Legalized. In it, you concluded that over 100 deaths occurred in the United States every year from complications of illegal abortions. From your testimony, it seems that the legalization of abortion resulted in obvious decreases in the mortality rate of women obtaining abortions in every country that you studied. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Uh, the, the, judgment to make abortions le the judgment to make abortions legal uh, in the 60s and 70s was based on hard data from Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, England, Greece, Hungary, Netherlands, and Poland, all documenting drops in deaths from the range of 60 or 70 per year to 15 to 20 per year after legalization. In a recent study published in the American Journal of Public Health, the researcher estimated the adjusted mortality rate as 25 times higher for childbirth than for abortion. Without getting into the technical details of that study, can you tell us if you think that that 25 to 1 estimate is scientifically solid? Yes, it is. That particular study took into account uh, problems of underreporting of maternal deaths as defined by a death one year after the end of pregnancy. Not all women who die one year after they're pregnant are considered deaths in some data collection systems. When you correct for that, as they did in New York and uh, uh, some other states, you get even a higher uh, maternal death rate 
and that ratio of 25 to 1 is based on that corrected figure. In the Surgeon General's report on abortion, he stated that problems such as infertility, miscarriage, low birth weight babies, and ectopic pregnancy are, quote, no more frequent among women who experienced abortion than they are among the general population of women. Do you agree with that statement? Yes, I do. That was the conclusion of uh, Dr. Hogue, an excellent epidemiologist at the Center for Disease Control, analyzing correctly and epidemiologically the data of uh, fertility subsequent to abortions. Dr. Forrest and Dr. Grimes, do you agree with that conclusion? Yes. Yes, I would. And yet there are clearly other points of view. How do you explain the claims by some that scientific data prove that abortion leads to problems in later pregnancy, such as low birth weight, ectopic pregnancy, and infertility. Dr. Hulka? These were early studies coming out of Europe in the 1970s, I'd say. These were not epidemiologically sound. Their, their comparison groups were not well selected. Dr. Grimes, the National Right to Life Committee has provided the subcommittee with a chapter written by Dr. Matthew Bolfin about medical and psychological problems resulting from abortion. Dr. Bolfin states that the medical problems that result from abortions tend to be treated by physicians other than the ones that did the abortion procedure and are therefore not included in studies that are conducted. Do you agree with that? In general, no. Why Most is that? abortions in the United States are performed in freestanding clinics. Most clinics have 24-hour call-in lines and arrange for follow-up, usually at no care to the patient after the abortion, should problems occur. So I think there are strong incentives, both personal as well as economic, to return to the original provider. If a woman has, who has decided to have an abortion has trouble finding a clinic in the area where she lives, that can cause delays. Does a delay of one or two weeks, in your judgment, Dr. Grimes, pose any problems? Yes, sir. Delay is one of the most important determinants of the likelihood of complications after abortion. For example, the risk of death increases progressively as the duration of pregnancy increases. So in general, the earlier the safer, and delays of any origin, whether they be economic, administrative, or geographic, increase the risk to the woman. In his letter to President Reagan, Dr. Koop stated that the research on abortion including the research on medical effects, is badly flawed. He stated that a major problem is that half the women who have had an abortion deny it. As I understand it, this could mean that in any study comparing women who had abortions with a comparison group of women who have never had abortions might actually include women who had abortions but haven't admitted it. How does this compromise the accuracy of research results? Mr. Weiss, how women respond to questions about abortion depends on who asks the questions and how the questions are posed. I don't find it surprising that when an official agent of the U.S. federal government knocks on a woman's door and inquires about her abortion history, she may be less than candid. This does not in any way mean that the same level of underreporting would be a problem for other research studies done by other researchers. In addition, this potential problem of underreporting relates only to what we call case control studies which look backwards in time. It would not relate to cohort studies or prospective studies which follow women forward in time after the abortion. Let me ask you about an experience you had at CDC a few years ago. According to a news article that was published in 1982, Dr. Ward Cates, former chief of the abortion surveillance activities, at CDC was transferred to another division. I know that you and Dr. Cates were the authors of many of the scientific articles on the impact of abortion. The article implied that the transfer was made for political reasons. Do you know the reasons for his transfer? Dr. Cates, one of the CDC's leading epidemiologists, was summarily transferred and demoted Dr. Cates and the abortion surveillance branch had documented that legal abortion in the United States was very safe. We were advised that this news did not sit well with the administration and Dr. Cates had to be protectively transferred. We have a copy of the 1981 
CDC abortion surveillance report. It was published in November of 1985. Is such a delay usual? No, sir, it was not. Ordinarily, the annual abortion surveillance report, a statistical compilation, would be published within two years of the close of the calendar year. For example, the 1973 report would be published during 1975. The 1981 report you referred to was completed in timely fashion, but was then suppressed, apparently for political reasons, for approximately two years before it was finally released and distributed. Do you have any other personal experiences of politics interfering with research on the medical effects of abortion when you were at the Centers for Disease Control? Yes, sir. In 1985, the CDC assembled a group of consultants to help write guidelines for preventing transmission of AIDS during pregnancy and childbirth. It was tacitly understood by everyone present that the word abortion could not appear in a federal document during the Reagan administration. Hence, compromise language was agreed to. It stated that a pregnant woman with AIDS or HIV infection should be apprised of the medical options for her pregnancy. Despite this, over the subsequent weeks, this language was weakened and then finally purged from the document, so the official guidelines make no mention of this option for a pregnant woman with AIDS. Thank you. Mr. Smith? Dr. Forrest, your uh, institute some time ago or once presented a study su uh, suggesting that uh, there were, in fact, several physical complications resulting from abortion. What reaction did this uh, study receive from your colleagues and the pro-choice uh, community as a result of this study? I, since we don't do research of a medical nature, I think you're probably referring to um, an article that was published in our journal, Family Planning Perspectives. Is that what you're talking about? It's referred, I think. referred to in some previous testimony, yes. Okay. It was not, it was not, it was not work that we did ourselves. Um, our goal has always been to put the information out in a very open fashion. And we have had people on all sides of the issues who have been pleased and sometimes displeased with what we've published. And, and I, I really don't remember any specific problems with anything that, that has come out. We've had people who don't like to see abortion rates going up, and we have people who have, have been upset when, when we published other information as well. You, but I don't know of anything specific about that article. Do you not recall any uh, uh, specific or any physical complications uh, that appeared in that article? I, I, I know, I believe what you're referring to is the review that Dr. Hulka discussed that was done by um, Dr. Carol Hogue, Dr. Christopher Tietz, and Dr. Ward Cates from CDC. And that did show that there were questions about the possible long-term complications related to abortion that w were multiple abortions, a woman who had many, done by procedures that are not the ones generally used for abortion in the United States. I believe they were Yugoslavian data. And that certainly raised some questions that I think have been dealt with by those authors and others themselves, um, showing that that is not in a, a situation under which women in the United States now are obtaining abortions. I can, if you'd like, I, I've not reviewed that recently, and I, I'm making the assumption that this is what you're referring to. I'd be glad to look into that further if you have more specific questions about it. If you would, please, and give me that in written detail. Certainly. Okay. And how difficult do you, is it for you to set aside the personal beliefs and reaching conclusions on this issue? Well, I and others at the Institute try very hard to be objective in what we're doing. We're people and everybody is a person who, and, and brings lots to their research. We're especially concerned about the fact that this could influence research and try very hard to lay out what we did, what was said, and how we reached our conclusions. I am comfortable with that myself. I think we do a fair and accurate job. I think the fact that you are as likely to read about us and, our, and have our research used in the National Right to Life News as you are in the New York Times um, says that, in fact, we, we succeed in that. But we try very hard, and especially we try to be very open about how we arrived at the, at the conclusions and how we obtained the data. Thank you. Dr. Grimes, 
Are there health consequences for a developing fetus resulting from a pregnant woman's health habits, such as her diet, for example? And if so, could you also describe the health consequences for a fetus as a result of an abortion? I don't believe that uh, there has been good documentation of the impact of diet on a developing uh, embryo. Uh, abortion is almost universally uh, fatal for an embryo. In what circumstances can lead to the underreporting of negative health consequences resulting from abortion as we've uh, heard here this morning, a little testimony a while ago? I can't give you a categorical response to that, Mr. Smith. That would depend on the type of study one is doing. And how much does the risk of death from abortion increase for a woman after the first trimester of pregnancy? The risk of death from legal abortion increases progressively throughout pregnancy. However, I should note that there is no critical threshold or a break point beyond which it increases much faster. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Smith? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Maybe I'll take a second to get on the record since I did miss the opening statement and I didn't want to interrupt the uh, smooth flow of things that was uh, happening when I came in here. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me start first by apologizing in advance uh, to the members of this panel and the next panel. I, I'll be back later, but I have, have the unique uh, pleasure today of manning the table on the floor of the House of Representatives, something they do to newcomers in this uh, body. And so I have to leave about quarter of 11 to go and sit in that room for a while. And, look at empty chairs, and then when it's over, I'll come back. We're pleased that you're joining us in any event. Okay, thank you. Um, first, let me say, uh, as I, before I get to two particular questions that I have, that uh, my position with regard to the overview of this uh, uh, extraordinarily difficult question is that a woman does have a right to choose to terminate a pregnancy. Uh, that has been my position for uh, my entire adult life since I was able to work through, uh, given my own sense of religion and experience uh, and the uh, awesome nature of this particular decision, um, uh, what I thought was right. It doesn't for a minute uh, stop me from understanding that this is one of a special breed of uh, questions, Mr. Chairman, in which people of very similar experience and very similar uh, religious uh, conviction can come to radically different uh, conclusions. It is just an ultimately personal decision, not only in terms of the act, but also in terms of how political leaders or just real individuals in the public feel about it. But I, for one, uh, have been and will continue to be in favor of a woman's right to choose. Two particular questions that I have for this panel and uh, uh, for, for each of you. Um, first of all, we talked, I think it was Dr. Forrest, you mentioned uh, the, question, the two things that could be done to reduce unwanted pregnancies uh, would be to improve uh, the methods of contraception and also to improve what I'm going to say the education or the utility. Uh, from my understanding, uh, is not that you, you, know, you could also, I know, have a list that was a mile long. But in Vermont, and I suspect nationally, there is also a correlation, a strong correlation uh, with self-esteem, with a sense of hope, with a sense of uh, a future. And uh, in many regards, that's cross-referenced with income level. Uh, is, there any, uh, is there any information that any of you know about to confirm that uh, hunch, uh, because that's all that's all it is uh, from on my part. Let me say that the data that have looked specifically at adolescents certainly have, some of it has pointed to the fact that adolescents who have more aspirations for the future, better hopes, better plans, are more likely to use contraceptives and more likely to avoid an unintended pregnancy. At the same time, I, th I think this is important but I think we have to remember that we are outstanding in the Western world in the rates of unintended pregnancy and abortion in this country. And while I think a piece of the, a piece of the puzzle is making clear to people that the future is important for them and for our country, that we see 
adolescents and we see women in other countries using contraceptives more often better than we are in the United States. And we, at the Institute, in, in trying to make some sense out of that and investigate it, we've been very struck by the deep ambivalence we have in this country about providing or not providing the information about how to behave responsibly sexually. And I, I yes, long-term goals are obviously important, but they're one piece of the puzzle. And as you know, the federal government has, has tried to support research and programs for contraceptive use, and have, the Congress has been more supportive of the administration in the last eight years for that. Yes, thank you. Is that anything to add? I would say that the, the spirit of the question is that I'm always um, powerfully reminded that regardless of who the winners and the losers are legally and politically in this battle as it goes on, uh, that there isn't any victory in the decision that we're talking about or the consequences of the decision for anybody. Uh, and I, um, and it's, it, it's that essence of the dilemma that, that I continue to wrestle with. Second question, uh, and you may have covered this before I got here, and if you did, I apologize, and I'll go back and do my, uh, do my reading. Um, is there a correlation that's been either ima you know, uh, considered or identified between the timing of the termination of a pregnancy in terms of the, of the full cycle and, the re and, and psychological impact? In other words, is there a relationship between the length of time a woman has carried a fetus and the, and the consequences uh, emotionally and psychologically of the, of the abortion? I could just say, I think that may be a question you want to direct to the next panel, but that one of the, one of the things that research does show is that women having abortions are very different. They're responding to a wide variety of situations, and they obtain abortions in very, often very varied situations. And I think it would be unreasonable to think that their reaction would not be colored by the situation in which they experience the abortion wanting a pregnancy, finding out at 18 or 19 weeks that there is a fetal pro health problem or their own health problem, going to a clinic and, and you know, being harassed, I would think is something that would affect the women and their reaction. But I think you have to ask that of the, of the psychological yeah. panel. Thank you. Thank you. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. I'm pleased to note and to welcome another distinguished member of our subcommittee, Congresswoman Pelosi. Uh, if you have any opening comments, we'd be delighted to hear it at this time, or if you have any questions of the panel, Ms. Pelosi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have an opening statement, but since I wasn't here at the opening, I'd like unanimous consent to be able to submit it for the record. Without objection, that will be done. Thank you. I would like to thank you for holding this important uh, hearing uh, on the medical and psychological impact of abortion. I am particularly pleased that in the course of the day we will have received testimony of Dr. Nancy Adler, a psychologist from San Francisco, who will present a report on the psychological effects of abortion, which was prepared under the auspices of the American Psychological Association. I mention that now because, uh, as you know, I'm on the banking committee and we're doing the SNL, so I'm trying to be in two places at one time, but I certainly want to spend as much time here as I can today. Uh, I appreciate the testimony of the witnesses, which I did have a chance to look over, and I apologize for not hearing it firsthand. Uh, my first question is to, um, is to Dr. Grimes. I see by your testimony that you were formerly with the CDC, addressing this issue in particular there. How, uh, how long ago did you leave there, Dr. Grimes? I left the CDC in the summer of 1986. And why did you leave? Uh, largely over the issue of censorship. What did you do while you were at CDC? I spent most of my time working on uh, the morbidity and mortality of abortion. I also spent the last two years at CDC studying uh, sexually transmitted disease morbidity and mortality. And you say you left because of censorship. Could you elaborate on that? Certainly. During my last few years at CDC, I had two scientific manuscripts that were censored by CDC editorial channels. The latter manuscript was an invited article on contraception invited by the Journal of the American Medical Association. The manuscript was not cleared and I was advised this was due to the fact that the word abortion was mentioned twice in approximately a 5,000 word manuscript 
and because my superiors did not want me writing about contraception. It's a little ironic that in the same uh, document that you're not supposed to discuss every medical option available for, uh, uh, in, in the case of preg unwanted pregnancy, that you're still not able to talk about contraception. Does there seem to be some kind of contradiction there? My superiors had struck an agreement with the center director that I would not use the word abortion. I was not apprised of this, though. What do you do now, Dr. Grant? I'm currently professor of obstetrics and gynecology and preventive medicine at the University of Southern California School of Medicine. It's uh, in, in your field, uh, this kind of, shall we say, censorship is something that I would imagine is uh, um, something to be avoided and not in furtherance of uh, the scientific <coughs> method. That's correct. Uh, I submitted the manuscript <coughs> to JAMA. It was published and I resigned my commission in the public health service. Do you think that the attitude of the CDC on this issue is, has improved since you left? I mean, not that you were part of the problem, but is there any reason for us to be hopeful about the attitude there now? I suspect not. Let me give you one instance uh, with which I have personal experience since leaving the CDC. Within the first year after leaving, I was invited back to present a paper at a major meeting uh, concerning the prevention of transmission of AIDS during pregnancy and childbirth. Uh, my name was added to the program and I made plans to travel back to Atlanta from Los Angeles. Seven days after I was invited, I was advised that the center director had uh, ordered my invitation rescinded because he considered me too high risk. I presume that meant that he knew I would mention that uh, abortion should be discussed with an AIDS patient who has uh, a pregnancy. Again, it appears that uh, those people specifically charged with uh the health and welfare of the people of our country and the public health service are m part of the problem more than part of the solution, uh, Mr. Chairman, I fear. Um, I don't really particularly like the word abortion myself, to be very honest with you, but it is a reality of life and it is a medical option that should not really not be up to somebody's uh, attitude, I think, at CDC, whether the word uh, can be used uh, or not. What, what do you, in, in light of that, what do you see uh, in, any, in this administration, you, you mentioned your more recent experience, but do you see any uh, potential for change of attitude there? Because quite frankly, dis despite what any of our individual feelings are, uh, none of them uh, should be public policy. Uh, the policy has to address making every medical option available to a woman in terms of what her beliefs and uh, attitudes are toward it. So what you're suggesting here is um, is frightening to me because of what you said at the start, that you use the word abortion two times and that uh, also they were uh, reluctant to accept the discussion of contraception. What way out do you see for us there? I would agree with your statement. As physicians, we are ethically obligated to provide patients information about all the medical options available to them, and I believe this kind of censorship is inappropriate. Well, my, since my time has expired, Mr. Chairman, I will just uh, simply thank Mr. Grimes and our other witnesses for their testimony. If, with your permission, um, I'd like to submit a couple of questions in writing. At Without objection, time. may do so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Pelosi. And let me indicate again, as I have at the beginning, uh, we're usually required by our schedules to be in about three places at the same time, and that's conservatively speaking. And so I'm grateful for members, to members for making time in their schedules for this hearing. And I know that uh, a number of them have to leave, but they will be returning and there'll be other members who will be joining us. Uh, so again, uh, my appreciation to all the members of the, of the subcommittee. I should also have said at the outset that uh, if a question is asked of one of you and uh, another w or one of the witnesses uh, wants to comment on it, please feel free to do that. And so let me present that opportunity if uh, any question was asked of any of, the, uh, any of you that you want to comment on, you haven't had a chance to, please feel free to do it at this point. Anything that you want to add, Dr. Hulka? No, no. Dr. Grimes, Dr. Farns? Well, thank you then very, very much for very important testimony and for making time in your very hectic schedules for us. Thank you. Yeah. Let me now welcome our next panel of witnesses. Uh, and ask them to again stand by the behind the, the name plates that will be placed on the table. Uh, they'll be Dr. Henry P. David, director of the Transnational Family Research Institute, who's testifying on behalf of the American Public Health Association.
Dr. Wanda Franz, Associate Professor of Psychology at West Virginia University, Dr. Ann Speckhard, who is a psychotherapist in Virginia, and Dr. Nancy Adler, a professor of psychology at the University of California at San Francisco, who's testifying on behalf of the American Psychological Association. As I've indicated earlier, it is our custom to swear in all of our witnesses, so if you all please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record indicate that each of the witnesses has responded in the affirmative. And again, I want to thank each of you for making time in your very busy schedules to be with us today. Um, again, we'll ask each of you to testify, and then we'll have questions when you have completed your prepared statements. Your entire prepared statement will be entered into the record, and we'd like you to have you to summarize your testimony in no more than six minutes. And Dr. David, I think we'll begin with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Henry David. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm the director of the Transnational Family Research Institute, a nonprofit research organization in the behavioral sciences. I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the American Public Health Association. Dr. David, Dr. David the uh, microphone should be a little bit closer to you, if you don't mind. Thank you. I have conducted psychological research related to unwanted pregnancy and abortion for about 20 years. I served as a consultant to the 1975 National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine study on legalized abortion and the public health, and I was pleased to serve as a consultant to the Surgeon General and his staff in the preparation of the Surgeon General's report on abortion. Behavioral research on psychological risks of abortion in the United States is, in my judgment, very difficult to design and implement. The absence of a national abortion registration system makes it hard to obtain nationally representative population samples and subsamples to follow women over time or to develop nationally representative control groups for comparison purposes. For that reason, the Transnational Family Research Institute is focused primarily on cooperative research with colleagues outside the United States to conduct studies of interest in the United States, but much more difficult to perform in the United States. I'm very happy to acknowledge that most of this work has been supported by grants from the Center for Population Research of the National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development. Perhaps most relevant for this hearing is a study conducted several years ago in Denmark, a country that is culturally comparable to much of the United States. Even more important, Denmark has a central population registration system with a unique person number assigned to every resident of Denmark on birth or upon moving to the country. This number is required to be used for all individual contacts with medical and social services. It eventually became possible to link the computerized abortion register, birth register, and register of admission to psychiatric hospital. We were able to obtain data on over 27,000 women terminating their pregnancies over 71,000 women carrying to term, and the entire population of over 1.1 million women 15 to 49 years old. In sum, we found no significant differences in first-time admissions to psychiatric hospital, which was an operational definition of adverse psychological reactions. Three months after abortion or delivery, for married and never married women. The risk was about the same, approximately 12 per 10,000 abortions or deliveries, compared to seven per 10,000 for all non-pregnant women of reproductive age. However, the much smaller group of separated, divorced, or widowed women who decided to abort what may have been an originally wanted pregnancy experienced 
a fourfold higher admission rate, 64 per 10,000, than the separated, divorced, or widowed women carrying to term, who had an admissions rate of 17 per 10,000. It was concluded that about one admission to psychiatric hospital per thousand abortions or deliveries did not constitute a public health risk, but that divorced, widowed, and separated women coming for abortion should be given special attention in pre-abortion counseling. Now, in reviewing my entire experience with behavioral research related to unwanted pregnancy and abortion, I would say that there's probably no psychologically painless way of coping with an unwanted pregnancy, no matter what course is chosen to resolve that unwanted pregnancy. And abortion is only one way of resolving an unwanted pregnancy. In my view, the normative reaction to the stress of an unwanted pregnancy or abortion appears to be a feeling of relief and conflict resolution that may for some women be accompanied by or followed by temporary feelings of loss, regret, or guilt. Major long-term psychological reactions are comparatively rare and, in my view, cannot be fully understood without considering the woman's psychological condition and coping resources at the time of experiencing the unwanted pregnancy and subsequently in her life. Women at particular risk for negative psychological reactions appear to be those who terminate a pregnancy that may have been originally intended, hold strict religious values, are highly ambivalent, decide to abort late in their pregnancies, lack the support of significant others, or are very young, non-white, and poor. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I wish to commend Dr. Koop and his staff for their scientific integrity in preparing their report, which I hope will soon be released. I also wish to express the gratitude of the Behavioral Science Research Community to the Center for Population Research of the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development for, for, for supporting studies in reproductive behavior and the resolution of unwanted pregnancies. To strengthen the much needed research effort, additional funds are needed to facilitate requests for proposals in this area. The encouragement of this committee would be most welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Dr. David. And just let me comment that as to the uh, Surgeon General's report, uh, that will become a matter of the public record in the course of Dr. Koop's testimony later today, and it will be available to the public and without objection. In fact, it will be entered into the congressional record. Dr. Franz? I'm pleased to be able to present this testimony on behalf of the Association for Interdisciplinary Research in Values and Ch Social Change. We had prepared the white paper for presentation to the Surgeon General on post-abortion psychological effects. We believe there is an urgent need to address the problems which we know are occurring among women who have had abortions in this country. It is estimated that since legalization there have been over 20 million abortions and that there are currently approximately one and three quarter million a year. Given the incidence of this potential health risk, any problems associated with it must be taken very seriously by the healthcare institutions in our country, and it's for this reason we applaud uh, your efforts and the efforts of the Surgeon General to pursue this issue. The Surgeon General's letter to the President emphasized the difficulty in drawing any firm conclusions regarding the psychological effects of abortion due to methodological flaws in the great body of the controlled research studies. He concluded that there is insufficient evidence to make the claim that abortion is safe for women, although this has been the position of our health care industry up until this time. It's clear that specialists and professionals on both sides of the issue are in agreement with the current studies that they are flawed. Both the reports of the American Psychological Association and the meta-analysis of our own association's white paper argued that current data are poor. 
Um, it appears to me that the findings of the APA literature search help to validate the conclusions of our meta-analysis um, since the findings concurred. Virtually all studies on after effects have drawn conclusion that abortion is safe. We have argued that this is precisely the body of data which has been demonstrated to be methodologically flawed, and therefore the conclusion that abortion is safe for women is inaccurate and unsupported by the data. In addition to these problems, one must rec recognize that this data was collected primarily from abortion clinics while women were recovering from surgery with relatively short follow-up times. Thus, these data are really evaluating the effects of crisis decision-making and not the effects of the abortion experience. Immediately following any difficult decision-making, there is a feeling of relief that a choice has been made. This is the reaction which is most described by most of these studies. In spite of this, there is not a single study which did not uncover some negative feelings, especially depression, guilt, and sadness. It is our position that these symptoms represent true problems which we ignore to our peril which may evolve into more severe difficulties at a later date. Unfortunately, there are no long-term adequate studies which can confirm this position absolutely uh, in terms of a prospective study. To truly understand the effects of abortion on women, one must evaluate women over a long period of time using effective psychological tests which will uncover any underlying problems. Since we don't have research, we in our efforts to understand the problem have turned to clinical data which, re which presented repeated evidence of true psychic harm to women, much of it occurring long after the time period covered by our current research. Women who report negative after effects know exactly what their problem is. They report horrible nightmares of children calling to them from trash cans of body parts and blood. When they are reminded of the abortion, they re-experience it with terrible psychological pain. They feel worthless and victimized because they have failed at the most natural of human activities, the role of being a mother. In addition, there is evidence of attempted suicide, drug abuse, relationship disorders, and damaged self-esteem among women who have had abortions and are troubled by them. Thus, there is no need to prove that abortion affects women. It is the women themselves who claim that they have been damaged. In addition to the methodological flaws in our current research, we believe there is a basic theoretical flaw. Most research treats negative after effects of abortion as trauma due to crisis re resolution and short-term reactions to surgery. These studies have never provided us with any theoretical focus to explain the findings. However, the negative effects of abortion can be seen to resemble the pattern of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, which is known to have affected Vietnam War veterans. This is characterized by a strong emotional reaction to a negative event which builds over time as the person struggles to reconcile his uh, actions into his life and his conscience and the role that society expects him to fulfill. These are problems which can be shown to emerge long after the phase of crisis resolution is over and the person begins to attempt to integrate the results of decisions into his life. This conclusion has been recently verified by a new study on Vietnam War veterans which showed that the number of men suffering from T PTSD is actually increasing over time. It is now estimated that as many of, as 15% of veterans may have been affected as compared to 2% in earlier studies. If women are suffering from a variation of PTSD and these figures are extrapolated to the population of aborted women, the potential numbers of women could, affected could be anywhere from 35,000 to well over 260,000 each year. If one accepts this assumption, then the reactions women report in clinical contexts can be easily explained. The delay in reaction, the severe emotional behaviors, the crying and depression are all typical of both kinds of patients. It's only in the studies that have investigated long-term effects which have dealt with the woman's true feelings and have looked at their clinical needs in which these effects become clear. If the Surgeon General's recommendation for additional research is undertaken, we believe it must be done with this syndrome in mind. It must be methodologically clean, as has been suggested, but also theoretically correct. And at least two conditions really must be met. Sufficient time must be included so that long-term effects of these experiences can emerge, and in-depth clinical tests should be used in order to truly affect the, um, study the effect. A scientifically tenable approach would be to assume that women are suffering from post-abortion syndrome, a variant of post-traumatic distress disorder, and then attempt to validate this assumption. This is a recommendation being made by our association as a focus for research. 
It, ultimately, it's important for us to seek out a possible explanation for this mechanism by which abortion causes symptoms of PTSD. We believe that it can be found in the independent research being done on bonding between parents and their infants and the nature of grief reactions to the death of the child. This approach can provide a theoretical model for describing the trauma which occurs in women as a result of an abortion. We believe that it is clear that a woman becomes a mother when she conceives the child and that a loss of that child any time following conception must be treated as a death and a need to grieve. If she fails to grieve, we believe that a period of denial ensues which is detrimental to her and has long-term impact on her personality. Dr. Franz, can you conclude? Finally, the members of our association are strongly committed to assisting those aborted women in need who deserve to receive the help and concern of health care professionals of this country. We should not allow this woman's issue to be treated with the casual disregard which in the past has been so common with many of the other health issues affecting women in our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me again note that we've been joined by another distinguished member of our subcommittee, Mr. Payne of New Jersey. Dr. Speckhardt. Honorable members of the subcommittee, my name is Ann Speckard. I'm a psychotherapist with a PhD in family social science, and I thank you for this opportunity to speak today. I've been called here to testify about the psychological health risks of abortion. My research in this area has made the important contribution to the literature of identifying and describing the components of a high stress reaction to abortion. I've included in my written testimony charts that list the major behavioral and emotional reactions to abortion. In addition to my research, I have worked clinically with approximately 150 women experiencing high stress reactions to abortion. On the basis of my research and clinical work with these women, I, in collaboration with others, have come to label these high stress reactions to abortion as post-abortion syndrome and to identify it as a type of post-traumatic stre stress disorder, a disorder you may recognize in conjunction with the Vietnam veterans. Since my time is limited, I refer you to the extensive documentation submitted today and in the copy of the white paper presented to the Surgeon General. Uh, in the meeting I attended with the Surgeon General on S September 15, 1987, Dr. Koop questioned us about the Centers for Disease Control's abortion surveillance, reports that we are relying heavily upon today regarding the physical and the psychological health risks of abortion. In that meeting, I told Dr. Koop that I felt the abortion surveillance was very poor, poorly done and that we needed other studies that would give us incidence and comparison data uh, in regard to the subject. I presented Dr. Koop with a proposal which he then sent me to Atlanta to present the same proposal to Dr. Mason of the CDC. I also met with Dr. Pratt of the National Survey of Family Growth. My proposal was revu reviewed by the National Center for Health Statistics Exec Review where some serious but not insurmountable considerations were raised. I have attached an earlier version of my proposal to my testimony today for purposes of elaboration. But briefly, my proposal was to use an already existing data collection source on American Fertility Patterns, the National Survey of Family Growth, which we could use to identify a representative sample of women and recontact them concerning their degree of postpartum stress. This would be not only women who've had abortions, but women who've miscarried, had stillbirths, and live births. So we would have the beginnings of incidence data and preliminary comparison data among the types of pregnancy outcomes. Although my time is limited, I would briefly like to reiterate from my written testimony some of the things that we do know concerning post-abortion stress. Uh, currently we know that even if it's a small proportion of women who are affected, the, the large numbers of women who are having abortions translates into a large number of women who would be affected. We know that adolescents are more severely affected. Uh, we know that adolescents deal with things in more concrete terms. They see death in black and white uh, terms. They are in see themselves often as invulnerable. They are, have a hard time projecting and anticipating the types of reactions that they may encounter, such as the grief and guilt reactions that we hear so much about. Also, it's, it appears from preliminary evidence that adolescents are much more likely to recycle, that is, they become pregnant again, abort again, or in many cases, refuse to even consider any alternative, even adoption. 
We have preliminary evidence for a variable of attachment or bonding that occurs during pregnancy and that seems to affect the degree of guilt and grief experienced. We also know that from all of the studies on postpartum stress reactions that even though there is uh, flaws in the research, low participation among post-abortion and poor follow-back in the major studies that we've relied on today, the follow-back has been only three months, and in some it's only three weeks. But despite that, we still find evidence for post-abortion stress. Also, we are today able to identify and describe what a high stress reaction to abortion looks like. So we certainly know that high stress reactions exist. We don't know to what degree, and we are not able to compare among pregnancy outcomes. Based on what we do know, and and the ways that we can collect data, it's my recommendation today that the subcommittee in its oversight capacity over health and human services works to release 600000 to $1 million of funding to uh, fund the National Survey of Family Growth so that they can do an in-depth follow-back study on postpartum stress reactions. In addition, funding needs to be released to improve the abortion reporting in current cycles of the NSFG to ensure better data collection in future follow-back studies. If I had more time, I would like to comment on the Centers for Disease Control, Abortion Surveillance, and what could be done in that area. In addition, I recommend that agency budgets allocate a high priority to funding clinical research into postpartum stress reactions. We need studies that can begin to identify predictors of high stress reactions, social context variables, and coping mechanisms, mechanisms that are both functional and dysfunctional. Further documentations of the types of research that are needed is again provided in my written testimony. Care and prevention de demonstration grants that would provide directions for community organizations that traditionally provide counseling and mental health services is also needed. Lastly, I do not recommend increased funding for contraceptive and family planning programs as a way to deal with this problem. We already have good research and preliminary indications that increased family pr planning programs uh, decrease the birth rate, but they, do not, but they lead to increased pregnancy rate and increased abortion rate, so it would certainly not solve this problem. Lastly, I would like to say, even if it is a small number of women that are affected, aren't these women important? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Speckhardt. Dr. Adler? My name is Nancy Adler. I'm professor of medical psychology, psychiatry, and pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco, and I'm testifying on behalf of the American Psychological Association. In view of the extremely varied quality of studies about psychological responses of women following abortion and following a staff report, the APA recently assembled a panel to examine the best research and see whether firm conclusions could be reached. To provide quality control, we set three minimum criteria for including a study in our review. First, the sample had to be of women in the United States. Second, the women had to have had their abortions under non-restrictive legal conditions. And these two criteria permit results to be generalized to current conditions. Third, the study had to be empirical. That is, based on a definable sample, use standardized procedures for collecting data, and subject the data to statistical analysis. This provides an important check on the replicability of results. Based on our just completed review, the panel was unanimous in the view that legal abortion, particularly in the first trimester, does not create psychological hazards for most women undergoing the procedure. The studies we reviewed consistently showed the incidence of severe negative reactions to be low and the predominant feelings following abortion to be relief and happiness. Some women report feelings of sadness, regret, anxiety, or guilt, but these tend to be mild. While this holds for most women, a few women do have more severe responses. Although these are rare, any cases of psychological disturbance are distressing. And we do know some of the factors which may put a woman at relatively greater risk for a more negative response, and these can be useful in identifying high-risk women. First, second trimester procedures of saline or prostaglandin installation are more likely to be followed by negative responses. Part of this has to do with the characteristics of women who delay until the second trimester. Frequently, they are teenagers who are so overwhelmed by the pregnancy that they deny its existence until it's too late to have an early procedure. This alone would put them at greater risk for more negative responses. 
In addition, the saline procedure is a more prolonged and painful experience than is dilation and evacuation. Studies comparing women in the second trimester having saline versus D&E show more positive responses from women having the D&E procedure. Fortunately, over 90% of abortions are done in the first trimester of pregnancy, and these carry with them lower risks of psychological difficulties than do second trimester abortions. A second factor influencing post-abortion reaction is the meaning that the pregnancy holds for the woman. For some women, a pregnancy may initially have been wanted, but changing circumstances may make continuation of the pregnancy untenable, and these women suffer greater losses. This is not to say that under such circumstances, the response usually or even universally is severe, but it's more likely to be negative than for women who are terminating a pregnancy which was never intended nor wanted. Having reviewed these studies, the panel concluded that abortion could best be understood within the framework of stress and coping. We know that many life events, even positive events such as job promotion or marriage, carry with them some stress, as do negative events such as job loss or ending a relationship. Individuals vary dramatically in how they respond to any given event. Their responses will be influenced by the meaning that the event has for them and by the psychological and social resources they have to cope with it. Responses to abortion follow the pattern that we've seen in response to other stressful life events. Abortion has the additional characteristic that it also helps to resolve what may be an even more challenging and stressful event, the occurrence of an unwanted pregnancy. Thus, in studying women following abortion, what is really being studied is the response to the entire experience of having an unwanted pregnancy which is terminated. A number of studies have used a design in which measurements have been made prior to the abortion and repeated afterwards. These studies have all shown drops in psychological distress after the abortion. This suggests that for most women, responses to abortion are less negative than responses to the unwanted pregnancy itself. To sum up, the best studies available on psychological responses to abortion suggest that severe negative reactions are rare and are in line with other normal life stresses. Given that approximately 21% of all U.S. women have had an abortion, if severe reactions were common, we would be aware of an epidemic of women seeking treatment. There is no evidence of such an epidemic. Data from before and after studies suggest that the time of greatest distress for women is prior to the abortion, and that abortion can contribute to a positive resolution of an extremely unfortunate and stressful event, the occurrence of an unwanted pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Adler. Again, uh, we will limit ourselves to uh, 10 minutes of questioning per round um, and go on until the questions have been concluded. Dr. David, you published a study comparing the psychiatric hospitalization of women who had abortions compared to women who gave birth. Of the thousands of women in this study, you found that for currently married or never married women, the rates of hospitalization were about the same. Twelve hospitalizations per 10,000 women following childbirth or abortion, is that correct? Yes. But for women who were divorced, separated, or widowed, abortion was more likely to be followed by hospitalization than was childbirth, is that correct? Yes, although the women who were divorced, separated, or widowed were far more likely to be admitted to psychiatric hospital if they were married or single, regardless of whether they had abortions or carried to term. Does that prove that at least in Denmark, where the study was conducted, that abortion has more psychological dangers than carrying an unwanted child to term. It's not exactly the absolutely correct comparison because the ideal comparison group would be a group of women who carried an unwanted pregnancy to term and involuntarily giving childbirth. Why would you not have studied the psychiatric hospitalization of women who carried unwanted pregnancies to term? It's not possible in Denmark, Mr. Chairman. Anyone who wants to have an abortion in Denmark is free to have it 
and no woman is compelled to carry an unwanted pregnancy to term. In the letter that he sent to President Reagan in January, Surgeon General Coop stated that, quote, when pregnancy, whether wanted or unwanted, comes to full term and delivery, there is a well-documented low incidence of adverse mental health effects. Does your research confirm that statement? That is technically correct, but it depends on how low incidence is interpreted. In terms of rates of admission to psychiatric hospital, there is no statistically significant difference between married and never married women having an abortion or carrying to term. However, I think it should be noted, Mr. Chairman, that there are very strong pressures on physicians not to hospitalize a new parent, especially if she's nursing. There are no comparable pressures to hospitalize women who have, who have had an abortion. Thus, it seems to me that there's a very strong likelihood that there are severe psychological problems are less likely to occur among women who have had abortions compared to those carrying to term because a sizable proportion of these women carrying to term will not be hospitalized if they are a nursing mother. Moreover, I would like to refer briefly to a study in Czechoslovakia, which is reported in my full testimony, where we did studies of 220 children born to women twice denied abortion for the same pregnancy and pair match controls and, look, and looked at the, at the parents as well. And here we found over a period of almost 20 years that there was a detrimental atmosphere in the home and although the mother may have been initially accepting of the pregnancy which she was forced to deliver, the atmosphere in the home was, was such that there was detrimental psychosocial development of the children born unwanted. Let's go back to the other finding of your research, that there are no differences in psychiatric hospitalization for women obtaining abortions or having children. What are the implications of that finding for American women obtaining abortions? Well, the implications in my judgment are that unwanted pregnancy and abortion do not constitute a major risk for psychiatric illness, at least not in the first few months. Although I would like to add that of course we have to be concerned about those women who do have adverse reactions. And I might add that I completely believe the case studies which have been reported in this area. But I would like to say that in the aggregate, the numbers are not such that they constitute a public health risk. I would also like to say that even in those cases of women with the most adverse psychological reactions who are hospitalized sometime afterwards, we really don't know if it was the stress of the unwanted pregnancy or the abortion which caused the problem, or whether there were difficulties in the relationship, in the partner relationship that led to the unwanted pregnancy and the abortion decision, or whether it, de whether it derived from the psychological condition of the woman at the time she experienced the unwanted pregnancy, or, or at the time she made the abortion decision, or even sometime after that. Uh, in the final analysis, I think the implication for the United States is that we need more research in the area of unwanted pregnancy and above all, Mr. Chairman, that we become far more prevention-oriented than we are, focusing on efforts to prevent unwanted pregnancy and thus reduce the incidence of, a, of, a, of, of abortion and hopefully, as Dr. Speckard has said, reduce even the incidence of that small number of women who do indeed have severe psychological reactions. Thank you very much, Dr. David. Dr. Franz, you've included with your testimony, and you referred to it, the white paper that you and Dr. Speckhardt and your colleagues wrote and presented to Dr. Koop on behalf of the National Right to Life Committee. In this paper, you cited Dr. David's research as one of the best studies proving the psychiatric problems associated with abortion. In fact, at one point in your paper, it is referred to as the best study. 
the white paper at page 10 quotes Dr. David's article as saying, and I quote, the rates of psychiatric admission are considerably higher, however, among women who obtained abortions, paren 63.8 per 10,000 admissions, close paren, than among those who delivered, than among those who delivered, paren 16.9 per 10,000, close quote. Now, that appears to be a mistake because the comparison quoted actually refers only to divorced, separated, or wid widowed women, and they make up only 5% of the study. Isn't that correct? Uh, the issue here is that there are the direction of the uh, data was, is correct, and that, in fact, there are the direction of the findings are that those women who had abortions had higher rate. Um, our concern is that, in fact, among the relationship breakups, the question has not been adequately resolved as to what caused that. And it is our feeling from our knowledge about women who have had problems with their abortion that, in fact, relationship breakups are the result of uh, the stress revolving around the abortion decision so that the cause and effect there is not uh, certain at all. And, in fact, it may be that the relationships are simply part of the stress of the abortion decision the relationship problems. Uh, Dr. David, would you comment on that question? I don't wish to have an argument with Dr. Franz, but I think what I wrote is very, very, very clear, that the figures cited apply to, to, to separated, widowed, and divorced women, and not to the total abortion sample. And yet the, uh, the white paper, uh, Dr. Franz criticizes Dr. David for misinterpreting his own data, for failing to discuss his, quote, findings, which indicate a four times higher rate of psychiatric hospitalization for women who have aborted. Why is that? Yeah. Our, our concern with this paper is that the findings apply only to women in the first few months after they have had the um, event occur. And to draw a conclusion that, therefore, abortion does not cause any problems for women is simply inconclusive because the findings from women who have problems with their abortion indicate that there is a delay, that there is a period oftentimes of denial, and that the real serious events occur, as with post-traumatic stress disorder victims of all kinds, much later than the event. The most immediate reactions following the abortion are of relief. It is the long-term concerns which we have an interest in, and we wish to emphasize that this type of research is limited because it does not take account of the possibility of post-traumatic stress functioning in these women over long periods of time. The six-month follow-through is simply not adequate from our own knowledge of women who have problems to uh, bring out the stresses that these women eventually uh, begin to show in terms of behavioral problems. Um, Dr. Evans, I'm not going to call on you each time, but at any time that you feel that you want to comment on interpretations of your own study, just let me know, and of course I will recognize you. Uh, Dr. David uh, stated in his testimony, Dr. Franz, that the comparison of his sample of women obtaining abortions with women who have just given birth should ideally have included only women who carried unwanted pregnancies to them. Generally, to term, generally when we think about women who have just given birth, we assume that most of those women are very happy to have a healthy baby. Do you believe it is scientifically appropriate to compare women having abortions with women who have given birth to children that they wanted to have? Um, I think that the concern here is that we have to realize that what we want is to find out whether abortion is a factor in, in men mental health problems. The argument which Dr. David is making is that uh, we wish to compare it with term birth, and I don't believe that that is the most important issue. What we need to find out is whether abortion has a particular etiology to uh, create specific problems. Clearly, post-birth trauma, depression is known. We know there is such. We have some ideas about how it functions. What we need to do now is to understand how post-traumatic stress functions and to make the comparison with 
birth, while it provides some interesting findings in terms of intervention and so forth, does not get to the issue of whether women are having these problems, what the nature of those problems are, and how abortion specifically impacts on their mental health and what makes this different. I think we, what he's trying to do here is to prove that childbirth and abortion are no more safe or no more dangerous. And I think that's not the issue. We know that abortion creates problems. What we need to find out is what indeed are those problems and to study them. And so I think while the study has some interesting implications, it does not really address the question, which I think is a major public health question, which is what does abortion do to women and what do we understand about the mechanism by which these stresses occur? Before I yield to uh, Mr. Payne, Dr. Davidson, again, it's your study that we were discussing. If you have any further comments on Dr. Franz's statement. I would like to make perhaps just one comment. Dr. Franz and Dr. Specker has talked about the few women. They admit the fact that there is postpartum psychosis, but I don't hear anybody ever having said that because a few women suffer from postpartum psychosis, therefore we shouldn't have childbirth. So I, th I think uh, we have to compare these things. And secondly, I would like to comment on the whole notion of post-abortion syndrome. I think as the Surgeon General's report will show, uh, there are two sides to that issue. Uh, my colleagues, Dr. Speckhardt and Dr. Franz, sincerely believe that there is such a thing as a post-abortion syndrome. I find do not. Uh, the reason for my position simply comes from the position of the American Psychiatric Association. The American Psychiatric Association has very clearly defined post, uh, uh, and post traumatic stress disorder as an event which is outside the range of usual human ex experiences. And that's really the essential feature of post traumatic stress syndrome, a life threatening event. I would submit to you that that does not apply to abortion. It is entirely correct that the American Psychiatric Association describes abortion as a psychosocial stressor, and I concur with that definition. But to jump from that to a post-abortion syndrome similar to, to Vietnam and to say that the abortion experience is similar to the trauma of, of Vietnam is making a jump that's a little bit bigger than I can make, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Payne? If you have an opening comment, by the way, that you'd care to make, that would be per perfectly acceptable at this point. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just would like to say that I uh, certainly commend you for uh, having uh, this scheduling this hearing on medical and psychological impact of abortion. And I'm uh, sorry that I came in late, and this is my first hearing on this subject, so I have very few questions to ask. I'm uh, basically listening and uh, trying to um, uh, learn the various impacts. I <clears throat> think, though, that there might have been a statement by one of the previous speakers, um, oh, Dr. Speckard. Um, did you indicate that um, there is uh, no evidence that additional monies for <clears throat> family planning has any, uh, in your opinion, had any effect on the reduction of the, uh, of the need or uh, for abortion? Did, did you say something uh, to that nature? No, uh, sir. What I have stated is that the preliminary evidence that we have today shows that family planning monies don't reduce the pregnancy rate. They have reduced the birth rate but the pregnancy rate has continued to rise along with the abortion rate. So if we're talking about post-abortion stress, it seems the family planning monies won't end that problem because the abortion rate continues to rise despite programs that are intended to end that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, is it necessary to conclude, therefore, that there has been no impact or would the problem be twice as great? Uh, you ever think of that? side of it? I would have to go back to the studies to give you exact numbers, but the studies that I'm aware of have shown that the pregnancy rates increase, the abortion rates increase, the birth rates decrease. In my view, that's not a solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. 
what would you suggest might be a solution? I would suggest that we study the problem of post-abortion stress, that we find out how these women are dealing with it, and I would like to say that I have never said that it's only a few women that are suffering from this. My estimations would be that it's a sizable number of women, and pouring more money into something that hasn't already solved the problem doesn't seem to be a good idea to me. Instead, I think that we should study through a national survey which we already have in place, such as the National Survey of Family Growth, what is the incidence of postpartum stress reactions across the board. And once we know the incidence, then we should talk about programs and how to best address that problem. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, no other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. Uh, then, Dr. Speckhardt, I assume that, that you're in strong disagreement with uh, Dr. Koop's position that prevention of unwanted pregnancies and information and knowledge about contraception is indeed the most effective way of reducing the levels of abortion in this country. I'm in disagreement because the research informs us that that is the case. Okay, just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Franz, let me review another section of the white paper uh, that you and your colleagues presented to the Surgeon General on behalf of the National Right to Life Committee. Uh, one point of the white paper concerns a meta-analysis of 75 articles of the on the psychological impact of ab abortion. As I understand it, this is a statistical analysis of results of these studies taking into account the results of each study and so on. Is that correct? Yes, that's generally correct, yes. Okay. Now, we had asked uh, Dr. James Rogers, the author of the meta-analysis, to testify, but unfortunately he was unavailable. So let me ask you two a few questions about it instead. Uh, I don't want to get too technical, so let me just summarize that according to the meta-analysis, the research that has been done is very flawed, but tends to show that abortion is psychologically da damaging. Is that a fair summary? Um, I think the findings show that the purpose of the meta-analysis was to evaluate the technical quality of the papers. And the meta-analysis found that the technical quality of the research was poor, that it was flawed. And in this, we agree with virtually all the other studies I'm aware of including the APA's own assessment, which was done in a traditional way, taking each of those characteristics of methodological problems that we look at, attrition and control groups and so on, evaluating them very carefully, and it was a very thorough job. Our analysis simply took a newer approach, which is the meta-analysis approach, which is being used more widely now to deal with wide varieties of studies where there are large numbers of variables to put them into a type of statistical program so that you can come up with something which evaluates in terms of error the value of those studies. And in doing that, we've simply repeated research that's been done by other people and found exactly the same thing, that the, these studies are basically flawed methodologically. Okay. Now, I know that you're aware of the criticisms of scientists at the Center for Disease Control who were asked to review the meta-analysis by the Surgeon General. They said that the meta-analysis is flawed because it tends to ignore the problems with the comparison groups, poorly defined outcomes, and other flaws that we talked about a few minutes ago. Can you or Dr. Speckhart respond to those criticisms? Um, yeah, my response to those and the response that we made was that um, the individual concerns about some of those small errors are a matter of opinion and that what happens is that you may, by making some changes in an analysis, and we, I don't know that this, ha this hasn't been done, so I don't know, uh, you may improve your error variance. In other words, you may eliminate some of the error that may be in the study and make a much stronger case by tightening up uh, some aspects of the study, and I'm sure that Dr. Rogers was, would be very happy to talk to anyone who would help him to make a stronger case um, or to evaluate it in a more complete way. But 
the important thing about the meta-analysis is not its statistical complexity or correctness, but the fact that it verifies all the other findings. It is simply a statistical way of verifying what we know from all of our other literature reviews. And so those details, while they might tighten the, the methodology of that particular approach, is really not particularly relevant, I don't think, to this committee's concerns, because it's the findings, the findings um, corroborate everyone else's. If, if our meta-analysis is incorrect, then that would cast some light on the APA's report, which came to exactly the same conclusion. I think that's really the issue with the meta-analysis. The scientists from the, uh, from the National Center for Health Statistics who reviewed the paper for, the white paper for Dr. Koo, said that the authors ignored, quote, many of the fundamental precepts of meta-analysis. I'm going to include these reviews in the hearing record, and I will offer Dr. Rogers the chance to respond to the criticisms of his meta-analysis for the hearing record as well. Dr. Uh, Adler, would you care to comment on Dr. Franz's conclusion that, in fact, the so American Psychological Association is in agreement with the meta-analysis conclusion? Actually, the American Psychological Association would be in agreement that many of the studies were flawed and should never have been put in a meta-analysis in the first place. The conclusion that abortion leads to damage based on the meta-analysis is in total disagreement with our review. That's one of the reasons we set criteria for including studies in our review because there are so many that are methodologically flawed that you can't include them in a review. So if you look at just the best studies, the findings are quite consistent. If you move beyond those and put them in a meta-analysis, you'll come out with findings that basically don't mean much. Right. Dr. Franz, you want to comment further? The uh, APA report clearly found the types of errors that one finds when you do these kinds of studies. There's simply a different approach was taken. Um, our, our assumption was that these were flawed and therefore we have no evidence to indicate that abortion is safe because these, were the, these, these are the body of studies available to us. That was our conclusion. Our conclusion was that since the research which has been used to support safety for women having abortions is flawed, therefore we have taken the position which Coop has taken, that there is no evidence that women uh, having abortion are safe. We, I mean, we don't have evidence that women having abortions are safe. These are the studies which, were, which are flawed, which, and this is the reason we drew the conclusion. But I noted that in responding to my question, uh, and I'm going to repeat it for you, you only responded to the part of it which addressed the flawed methodology of the studies. Uh, you did not respond to the conclusion that you drew, what Dr. Rogers drew, that uh, that the study, that the meta-analysis tends to show that abortion is psychologically damaging. Now, he does draw that conclusion, doesn't he? I'm obviously not Dr. Rogers, and that's not my field of expertise, but I do know that Dr. Rogers was very careful to take the best studies, and Dr. Davids was included for that reason, and I think it was 11 studies. There was very careful criteria for deciding which studies should be um, included, and Dr. Rogers felt, um, according to the precepts of meta-analysis, which are carefully laid out, and I'm sure Dr. Rogers will be able to elaborate on this, that once he had those 11 studies chosen, that he was able to control for error within studies through the use of the meta-analysis and come to his conclusions, um, and that they are valid conclusions based on that. But again, the conclusion that, uh, that you, you agree that in fact the, the meta-analysis said that although the research has been, has been done as flawed, it tends to show that abortion is psychologically damaging. That's, his, that's Dr. Rogers' conclusion. Is that correct? That's because Dr. No, Rogers... No, no, I'm, I, I want you, just want oh. you to answer whether, in fact, that is his conclusion or not. Uh, as you've read it, it it's stands okay. in the report. So that, and that, that's why I, I, I'm stressing this, because Dr. Franz has been saying that... The, what the meta-analysis shows is that it's impossible to draw, or it's not possible to draw a conclusion. And that would be one position that, that could be disagreed with and is indeed disagreed with. But in fact, Dr. Rogers goes a step further than that. Not only 
that you can't draw the conclusion that it's not psychologically damaging, but in fact he says that it tends to show that abortion is psychologically damaging. That is the conclusion, isn't it? Yes, based on the 11 best studies, that is the conclusion. Although I think you misinterpreted Dr. France's statement. What she was saying is that other conclusions by the APA and other reviewers of the literature that haven't used meta-analysis concur and add validation to Dr. Rogers' conclusions. Not to the conclusion that abortion is psychologically damaging. You agree that, that in yes, fact, the American agree. Psychological Association does not agree with that conclusion? I agree. Thank you. Uh, now, Dr. Speckhard, you've described what you call the post-abortion stress syndrome in your testimony. I understand that you did a major study on this for your doctoral dissertation. Can you tell us how you located women to interview for your research? Yes, I'd be glad to. Uh, I studied 30 women in an in-depth analysis, and my purpose was to identify and describe a high-stress reaction. Uh, I used a snowball technique, which means that I identified one woman, then she gave me the name of another woman, and it continued in a network like that. So each woman in the sample knew one other women, woman, but they were not a cohesive group of women. So that the women were volunteers who were willing to discuss their feelings but were not under any pressure to do so, is that correct? Yes, and they were self-identified as high stress. Right. On the other hand, since you only interviewed women who responded negatively to the abortion, it is not possible to tell from your research how common this syndrome is, is that correct? I'm sorry, I couldn't understand what you said. You interviewed only those women who responded negatively to the abortion, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So it's not possible to tell from your research how common this syndrome is, since of necessity the universe of people whom you interviewed were those who were, who were self-selected or referred as people who had negative reactions to the abortion. No, sir. From a study of 30 women, we can't draw incidence data, but we can identify and describe what a high-stress reaction looks like. To, the, to those women who had negative reactions? Yes. But you can't tell how common it is? No, of course not. Thank you. Can you, on the basis of your study, tell, tell us how many women, what percentage of women, out of the one and a half million women who have abortions every year, suffer from the kind of symptoms that you describe? No, sir. That's why I'm asking that you as a committee would authorize monies to do incidents and comparison studies through the National Survey of Family Growth, because we have no incidence data. We know that some women have high stress reactions, but we don't know how many, and we need to begin to study how many and how they compare. Do you know of any other research that you believe is really well conducted that can answer that question? No, I don't. Uh, I certainly don't want to put down Dr. David's study, and I know that he's done a good job, but he studied women over a short time period. I think it was three months postpartum. And he also used a variable that I wouldn't use, which is uh, psychiatric admission. He admitted a problem post-delivery that women are not uh, perhaps admitted because they're nursing babies. Well, the same thing is true for post-abortion. The, the women that have high stress reactions avoid the medical system. They don't go to their doctors. They don't tell their doctors what's bothering them, that it's abortion related at all anyway. And at all costs, they avoid the medical system, so that wouldn't be a good variable to measure post-abortion stress anyway. So no, there are no good incident studies at this point, especially that study long-term reactions. Dr. Franz, are you aware of any well-conducted, scientifically valid research that can answer the question of how prevalent a post-abortion stress syndrome, syndrome might be? No, the only thing that we can do at this point is to look for some indications of similar sorts of patterns of behavior that have been studied in other contexts. And that's what we've done with post-traumatic stress disorder. Since the women so clearly um, model the same sorts of problems and reactions that the Vietnam War veterans had, we have used that as a way of extrapolating. And that is one way by going to another population that looks as though they may model our population and extrapolating figures, but we have no studies, and that is again the reason why we're very eager to see this research undertaken, so that we have some idea of the numbers. The incidents we do not know.
What is known about the psychological impact, uh, Dr. Speckhardt, of carrying a pregnancy to term if that pregnancy resulted from rape or incest? And how does that impact compare to abortion for women who have been the victim of rape or incest? Is there any research on that to your knowledge? I'm not aware of any good research on uh, the psychological impact of abortion following rape or incest, but I would imagine that a woman having that sort of experience would be already traumatized and abor abortion may further traumatize her. And I have seen that clinically. Does anyone else on the panel know of any research on that or have any opinion on what the results would be? Dr. David? I'm not aware of any specific research, but the clinical incidence is that particularly in cases of incest and rape, women are very much relieved afterwards not to carry such a, such a pregnancy to term. And that seems to me just to be common sense. Dr. Franz? Yes, I think, though, what you're seeing there, again, is that relief reaction immediately following decision making. And it really is not, um, that is not the sort of database that we want to use to look at this problem. In fact, in the cases of rape and incest, we find that the uh, choice for most women is not to have abortion, and that women that do carry those babies to term um, clinically uh, are generally very satisfied and very happy with their decision. I think that we have to be careful to realize that abortion isn't the solution that these women themselves generally choose and that the outcome for those women, we have no large-scale studies, but the clinical studies indicate that though they are no worse than women who have carry their babies to term for other reasons, for other causes. Yes. Would you, would you believe, would you think that, that there ought to be further research on, on this issue? I certainly do think there should be, and there has been, there's been some effort to do some clinical research, but I certainly think that we need to have a better understanding of the mechanism of the traumatization of the woman uh, who is traumatized and victimized already by the um, rapist. The further traumatization due to the destruction of her own child, we believe, could be a very severe trauma, and there are some case studies that indicate that for some of these women, this is a very severe factor. Dr. Dave? Uh, I don't wish to engage in an argument, Mr. Chairman. I would just like to say that psychological research in this area is extremely complicated. It's complicated by the judgments which clinicians make, and very able clinicians on the basis of their own beliefs make different judgments and that's the reason why in Denmark we took admission to psychiatric hospital as our key. I'd just like to say that psychological research in this area is extremely complicated. It's complicated by the judgments which clinicians make. And very able clinicians on the basis of their own beliefs make different judgments. And that's the reason why in Denmark we took admission to psychiatric hospital as our key criterion. No one could argue that this was not or it was a psychological reaction. These women either were a danger to themselves or to others. Unfortunately, psychological research is not always a complete science. We do have different judgments by different people they're honest people and they're sincere people, but they do come to different conclusions, just as Dr. Franz and I are coming to different conclusions here. Yes. One other point on that is that the advantage of the clinical research is that you are getting the opinion of your client. In other words, the, the case studies that are done are telling us what the women themselves are feeling about this and not the interpretation that someone puts on them. And I think this is this is one of the values of that type of research. The women speak for themselves, and I think this is an important thing in, in an area like this. We need to hear their concerns. Why, why would you think there is not more research on this? You agree that there should be, but why, why do you think there is not more research on this? I think that there is a lack of interest on the part of our health care institutions in this country to find out about what happens to women uh, because of abortion. I think there's been a long-standing lack of interest in this. Um, it has been 16 years since the Supreme Court decision, and yet we haven't had any major national research studies. We haven't included it in our regular samples of data collection. 
Um, there has been a but lack of interest. But I assume that the, the research that we're talking about is not just of those who have abortions, but also those who carry to full term, right? Mm -hmm. Why would there not be a, a comprehensive study of that? It seems to me that this is part of a pattern, and I alluded to this at the end of my testimony, that, that by and large women's health issues have not received good attention. And postmenstrual syndrome, is, or premenstrual syndrome is something that received very poor attention, yet we knew clinically it existed and has existed. I think women's issues have received poor attention. Um, there hasn't been a lot of money put into concern about women's issues, and I think we are dealing here with a woman's health issue. The women who are suffering from abortion see it that way. They feel that they're victimized by a medical um, institutions which really haven't taken their concerns to heart. They go back, these women go back to our medical institutions asking for help and do not receive it. One of the most interesting findings we have when we talk to the women who are stressed already is that they are repeatedly turned away from receiving care because it is assumed that they can't possibly have an abortion-related problem. They're told that they can't have an abortion-related problem by medical and, and health care officials. I think we simply have not given the kind of attention to their individual needs that they deserve. And I think they have a right to demand it. And I feel that we, from our position, association, are speaking for these women. Thank you. Dr. David? Um, I would again like to take a bit of an exception, if I may, Mr. 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 Chairman. I've never been aware that the Center for Population Research of the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development had a policy of not considering research proposals in this area. Quite, quite the contrary. The experience of our institute demonstrates that such research grants are being funded. But I would like to submit two points to you, if I may. There is no national abortion register in this country, and we do not track postpartum illness. It is simply not part of our system. This makes it much more complicated. The second complicating factor is that women, in my experience, do not wish to be reminded about having abortions. As a matter of fact, studies in other countries where abortion is legal demonstrate conclusively that a large proportion of women deny the abortion that they have had, even when we know they've had it, except when the next child has a problem. Then the first thing that's remembered is the abortion. But in our, in our study in Czechoslovakia, which I mentioned in my presentation, 38% uh, of the women who twice denied, uh, who were twice denied abortion for the same pregnancy, subsequently said that they had, n they had not even once requested an abortion for that particular, particular pregnancy. So we're dealing with a situation where a sizable proportion of women will not admit to having pregnancies, will, will not admit to having abortions. I would like to say that if we then go into the field and take a random number of women and ask them about abortions, I would not have very much confidence in the findings because of the large proportion of women who will not respond. I think if we had a post prospective study and follow women carefully, and if we had a request for proposals through the Center for Population Research, where different scientists could make their own proposals and not leave it to one or two government agencies, much as I respect them, but if we open the door to general research by qualified, competent people whose proposals will be peer-reviewed, and if this, this is given publicity, Mr. Chairman, I think we will have a great deal of research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. David. Ms. Pelosi? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Friends, you've mentioned that, um, that in a case of rape and incest, when these women carried these babies to term, they were happier about it and the rest. Do you think that their contentment uh, was, uh, sprang from the fact that they made this decision themselves to carry the baby to term? Do you think that that is their right? You're speaking of the rape victims? Yes, I'm sorry. And, uh, yes, rape and incest. Well, certainly I think there's no question that when we look at women that have problems following any kind, particularly following their abortions, one of the characteristics of women with those problems is that they didn't feel that they were in a position to make choices which they wanted to make. 
the majority of women will report that abortion, for instance, wasn't their first choice. And I believe that that is a factor in uh, contributing to the stress that women feel following abortion. So that certainly if the woman is in a situation where she's raped and has additional trauma, I would think that her being able to make a choice to feel that she understands that she has all of the options available, that she's been given the support that she desires to have and is not being put into a situation where she has to do something she basically doesn't want to do, that certainly the outcome would be better. There's, okay, so that you're saying my, that, that it's a healthier situation if the woman uh, has free choice to decide what course she will take. I think if the woman is fully informed and feels that she's supported with what she wants to do, yes. That's right. No, we're not agree. talking about any intimidation of one medical option or another. We're just saying, okay, so in, if that is the case, what you describe, if she's fully informed and knows what her options are and participates in that decision, do you then think that, that uh, we're talking about the psychological effects, mm -hmm. that yes. if a person uh, cannot afford the medical option legally that she decides upon, may it be terminating the pregnancy, uh, then her decision might be to carry the baby to term, and is that a healthy psychological situation? This, that's, the situation is that in most of those cases, women will say, I wish to have the abortion because I can't afford to, ha to take care of this baby, but that is not their first choice. In many instances, those women would like to have the money, they would like to have the support, they would like to have the prenatal care, they would like to have the resources to carry that child to term. And what we find in the population of women who are having problems following their abortion is that they really were not given those kinds of options, that had they had their choice, they would have preferred to have the money and not to kill the baby. Well, I, I don't accept and fully I think the that, terminology. That probably is one of the factors that leads to the stresses that they feel later on. But we don't know that yet. This is simply a clinical assumption from the cases that we've seen. Uh, we Mr. Chairman, have... it's very hard to stay with the scientific method that we're trying to establish here just to see uh, how, um, how, what conclusions we can draw uh, relating to the scientific methodology. But it all, as with many of the subjects we deal with, it comes down to money and psycho the psychology of being able to afford options. Uh, affordability of a large family is a, is a, because everybody would probably like to afford to be able to have a large family if they enjoy being, uh, having children. But they also, I w when I was talking about affordability, I was also talking about affordability of every other medical option. And I can't separate myself from the fact that you said when these women choose to carry the baby to term or decide to carry the baby to term, they're usually happier that they did. And when you say choose, decide, any words like that, then I can't, I see an inconsistency in, um, in not allowing that option available to everyone to choose or decide whether she can afford the medical option or not, in addition to being able to afford the baby. You're referring not. strictly to abortion as a medical option here, I'm assuming. I'm when I'm sorry. saying every medical option, I'm not saying, I'm saying every medical option. And, and uh, as we t discussed earlier, I, th I agree that the more information and the better education we can have on um, sex education and planned parenthood and the rest, so to even avoid people being at this point, you know, that's one, of, that's I think one of the serious uh, shortcomings of our system is that we do not fully uh, provide as much Planned Parenthood type information and so people uh, find themselves in the situation of choosing between uh, terminating a pregnancy or not when the, the, with education we would never have to even come to that point. I think the issue is that when a woman goes for counseling for abortion it's assumed that she is making a free choice, that she has all the options available to her that she knows what her options are and that she chooses on her own. And while I'm sure that there are women who have that information, the fact is that the way our current laws are worded today, there is no requirement of any kind for anyone providing abortions to provide that information. In fact, it has been groups like Planned Parenthood that have fought those laws. So that as it stands right now in every state in the union, 
there is nothing that requires anyone to give that information to a woman. Now, when we see these women later, and I'm talking about hundreds of women that we talk to who are having problems with their abortions, one of the things they will say is that they are very upset that they did not receive full information. And the majority of them, the vast majority of them, in the 90 percentages, are, feel that they did not re receive adequate information when they went for counseling. And I think this is the sort of thing that needs to be looked at. We need to do me more research in this area. Women in this country today are not getting information at the clinics. For some of these women, and we don't know the proportion, that lack of information leaves them feeling victimized, and that's the term they choose. I'm not choosing it. That's what they call themselves. They feel victimized, and they feel as though they've been used by a system that they didn't understand and were inadequate to make a free choice. Can you jump in? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Well, I, but then you must give some value and worth to an even more general education program to, so that people, before they get into that position, are aware of what the consequences are of certain actions Absolutely. and how difficult they are. And I think is. that's the reason it's so important for us to let women know that we have evidence that there are problems. I mean, I think most of these women aren't aware that there are, there are risks, there are health risks, there are health risks. They are told that abortion is so simple that it's not, there's not a health factor, but every procedure has health risks. And they're, so told, I think they're told that there are no health risks? Th this is what these women are reporting. And I think the issue is... Can you document is, that in a scientific fashion, that they're told there are no health risks? We ha yes, you we can have, practically I not can even get your ears you. pierced without having a health exactly, risk. Exactly, and that's why this is such an appalling situation, um, that women are not being informed, and the women themselves are reporting this. And I can give you a reference to a book by Dr. David Reardon, which is nothing more than... A, a write-up of the feelings and responses and, a, and the experiences of over 160 women around this country who have been through this process and are commenting on it. This is not anyone's interpretation. Their own comments are the words I'm giving you here. And I think this is the thing that concerns us, is that because there, there is no legislation requiring this, and while I'm sure that there are people there who are There is legislation that does prohibit it uh, uh, in, in terms of... of presenting uh, a, uh, an abortion as, an, as a medical option if any federal funds are involved in it. So actually the reverse situation is more prevalent than what you describe. A. B. Uh, 160, while that, you know, any woman in distress or concerned about her psychological state of mind is, is a concern, 160 is not a very big sample in light of the numbers uh, that, um, of, of abortions that take place each year. Uh, Dr. Adler, could, would you comment on what you've heard here? Yes, Ash, I think there are a few things to, that, to comment on. One is that there are studies from medical literature where patients have gone in to be with their provider that they're actually taped. The provider has told the patient they have a certain diagnosis, and a certain percentage of patients will walk out and claim they never heard the diagnosis. So I think you have to be careful to, to take a statement that they were never told X carefully, and I think we do need you really need to document what went on in the interaction to know what the woman heard versus what was actually said. The other issue really does have to do with the incidence issue. Um, in following, if you were going to, for example, try and uh, extrapolate the incidence of strep throat to all school-aged children, and you sat in a pediatrician's office and looked at children who came in with sore throats, you would think the whole world had strep throat. If you go to the schools, you notice that lots of children are walking around no. healthy. So I think when you sample for women who have problems, it is not to deny that they have problems. You cannot know the cause of it, that it was the abortion, because there's a cascading set of events that happens when one becomes pregnant. And the fact that one has gotten into the situation of being pregnant has implications for the woman. There is one very carefully controlled study that followed teenagers um, a year afterwards, where they, they compared teenagers who had term birth uh, first trimester, trimester abortion and second trimester abortion, controlling for all sorts of socioeconomic variables and demographic variables. Using the MMPI, which is a good objective indicator of clinical status, found no differences among the groups. And I think it, it suggests what uh, Dr. Franz was alluding to, that women and adolescents who can choose a given option probably choose the option that's best for them. And it's when they're denied that option 
that there may be problems, and that's true for the options across the board. In that one study, it w the only group to show more adverse, or actually less adverse effects was the fir first trimester abortion patients scored lower on somatic symptoms than either the term birth group or the second trimester abortion group. That's, I think, the most carefully controlled study we have of a long-term follow-up showing actually, if anything, a more favorable response to abortion. My time has expired. I thank the witnesses and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Payne? Yes, I <coughs> just have a, a short question uh, to Dr. Franz or Dr. Speckhardt. Uh, you indicated that with rape or incest that's traumatic and then to uh, then go towards the option of, um, of an abortion, which therefore is a dub double traumatizing. Uh, have either one of you um, thought of the additional trauma or what effect it has on women that you, you were talking about how medical um, attention, um, research and dollars have not been funded to, to adequately look at women's health problems. Have you, um, would you be able to, to determine what damage um, groups do when they scream and yell and put placards in front of abortion clinics when these women who are maybe double traumatized uh, have to go through that to have that as an additional lay on um, as it relates to a choice uh, that they're making for whatever reason. Yes, I'd like to comment on that. Um, and I'd also like to say in talking about the rape and the incest that we're talking about a very small group of women and um, I don't think we should generalize to all women having abortions. I mean, we're talking about a particular type of trauma, rape and incest is very difficult to deal with and abortion may add to that trauma or take away from it, we really don't know. And we all have our clinical opinions based on women that we've seen. But when you broaden it to uh, women having abortions in their societal context, and does the views of the so society around them contribute to their traumatization, I would say definitely. We live in a society where abortion is not completely socially accepted. Women don't tell each other that they've had abortions. Women don't tell each other that they've been highly stressed following their abortions. So the women that walk away from an abortion feeling that, boy, I, I sensed a death experience. I um, now associate my uterus as a death site. I felt that a baby died when I was on the table. And Dr. David was saying um, that post-traumatic dis stress disorder requires a life or death type trauma. Well, these women are talking about that sort of thing, that they feel that they experienced a life or death trauma. And yes, if they feel that they are um, social networks view abortion as the taking of a life, that's going to add to their traumatization. Not, and, and it doesn't mean that they wouldn't have been traumatized anyway because of their own views, but social context variables are very important, and that's one of the things that I've asked that we put some money into in research, look at a woman's social context and how it affects her post-abortion stress. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. Dr. Adler, your research also examined the negative psychological consequences of abortion for some women. Is that correct? Yes, it did. And do you agree with the consequences that Dr. Speckhardt described earlier? Well, it, it's the issue of sampling that I was mentioning. In my sample, I did not find women who had those responses. I think it was a more representative sample of women undergoing the procedure. So I have no doubt that there are women who experience what she's describing. My estimate is it's a very small number. Is there any research on the psychological impact of delays in getting an abortion, that is getting an abortion a few weeks later after the decision is made to do so? Yes, there, there are two reasons that that is problematic. One, as I was citing in my testimony, second trimester abortion procedures are more stressful than first trimester. So delay into the second trimester makes things more difficult for the woman. In addition, the before and after studies show period of greatest distress is prior to the abortion. So to incur a delay means increasing the period under which the woman's under greater stress. In their meeting with the Surgeon General staff, the American Psychological Association scientists stated that since millions of women have had abortions, 
it would be possible to detect any widespread severe psychological effects if they existed. Could you explain that to us? Yes, if you assume even an incidence of 1%, given the number of procedures that are being done, which are approximately 1.5 million a year, that would be 15,000 new cases attributable simply to abortion. The mental health system would have detected such an upsurge. In the post-Vietnam stress disorder, the it came to the awareness of the clinicians because of the number of people seeking treatment. We have far more women who have undergone abortion, and the mental health system has not detected a problem. Would you agree with Dr. Franz and Dr. Speckhart that some women feel a great deal of guilt or sorrow for a long period of time? Yes, I think some women do. According to the Surgeon General's letter to, the, to President Reagan, all psychological studies that have been conducted are methodolo methodologically flawed and therefore cannot provide evidence of the psychological impact of abortion. Do you agree with that conclusion? I agree with the first part, but not the second part. They are all methodologically flawed. I think when you take them as a body, the flaws start to offset each other. They're done with different samples that have different kind of sampling biases. They have used different measures which offset the strengths of one versus the weakness of another. That's why when we looked at the best studies, despite the methodological flaws of any one study, we felt that we could reach the conclusion of little damage from abortion given the vast weight of the evidence across studies. Yes, okay. Um, Mr. Smith? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Franz, if there's so many women that are negatively impacted by abortion, how come we never see them? Yeah, I think this is the question of concern, and I think that uh, we, they are, in fact, being seen. Um, the problem I alluded to earlier was that women go back to the standard health care settings, the clinic where they had their abortion, and they are not um, helped in those settings. And they have been forced to go outside and look for help wherever they could find it. And what we are finding is that clinicians around the country are beginning to pick up these cases and reporting them. And they are not being picked up, though, by the standard health care systems because there's no place for them in those systems. They're not being received there. And this is one of their greatest pains, that they've been damaged, they're in pain, and they're going looking for help. And the traditional health care systems are not open to that. They're simply told many times that they shouldn't have, they shouldn't feel bad, and um, they're, they're not given the kind of support. Secondly, we've already talked extensively about the fact that these women are in denial. I think uh, Dr. David's point that these women are in denial is a very real one. They are denying their abortion, and that is a sign of trauma. The denial itself is a sign of trauma. And those women are suffering, and they are suffering alone, and they're not getting the help they need. Anyone, any woman who's had an abortion who goes to speak will always find two or three more women in that crowd that will come to them quietly afterwards and say, I need you. I'm in a lot of trouble, and no one has paid any attention my needs and where have you been and I think these these are the cases that we're picking up women are suffering very quietly and they have very few resources and so what we have instead are support groups women support groups all over the country that are being formed and there are thousands of women in these support groups and they are helping each other and in this sense they look very much like the Vietnam War veterans after the war who could not get anyone to pay attention to their needs and had to set up their own support groups this was a very common a situation for them as well. So I think the, the women are not being picked up in the standard health care areas, but they are definitely there and they are in need. And I think we represent uh, a group that wants to represent them and their needs to the, to the uh, health care institutions. What, uh, what types of uh, uh, develop developmental problems have teenagers experienced when confronted with abortion? 
Um, I'm, I am a developmental psychologist, and my interest is with my, I have a very great concern with the developmental immaturity of teenagers um, and the impact that abortion might have on them. I believe that as with much of the other research, teenagers' needs have not been adequately explored developmentally. There's been a great deal of claim that teenagers can make decisions regarding abortions, and I think that no developmental psychologist who works with teenagers would ever believe that these kids are really mature enough to make major health care decisions. I've, in all of my experience in working with developmental psychologists, the thing that we know about teenagers is that they have very limited capacity to handle very complex decisions. And I believe that one-third of all of our abortions are to teenagers. And I think these teenagers are being poorly served in that they are, it's assumed that they will simply take some information and go out and make these decisions, and they can't do that. They're cognitively incapable of evaluating it, taking account of long-term goals, which we've already seen are the critical goals, the long-term problems that are going to occur, taking those into account and making their decisions. So I feel that developmentally teenagers are bound to be at risk because of their decision-making inadequacies, and we need to look at that a great deal. We, need, we really need research in that area, and I really appeal to the committee to look into that as a possible research area. Thank you, Dr. Brands. Dr. Speckard, could you tell us a little more about uh, what you've personally done in this area to develop research proposals and where this type of uh, work could go? What I'd like to tell you... Oh. What I'd like to tell you is that um, after I finished my research and it went out in the press, uh, there was reporting of uh, the proportions of women that I reported upon in a sample of 30 women. And there was some confusion about whether that could be generalized to incidence data. And there were questions of how many women are stressed. So in trying to answer those questions, I put together a proposal for the federal government. And in talking with Dr. Koop, we talked about the current state of the Centers for Disease Control Abortion Surveillance Program, which we have relied on heavily today to report on physical health risks of abortion. And I would just like to say that currently the way that we learn about abortion health risks in our country is through a physician reporting system. That means that the phys physicians themselves report to the CDC and say, I, I have seen a woman that's been stressed by her abortion or that, or in an emergency room, a woman has been admitted for post-abortion uh, morbidity. We have to consider, do the physicians have any incentive to report? If they've been uh, in any way included in the abortion procedure and the woman is reporting abortion morbidity, they may not want to report to the CDC because they'll bring an investigation down upon themselves. On the other hand, do they know that the, women, uh, that the morbidity is related to abortion? We know from studying high-stress women that they fear others learning of their abortions, that they uh, avoid the medical system, and when they go to the medical system, they don't admit having had abortions. We have national data that shows us that one half of the women having abortions don't admit to having had an abortion. When I met with uh, researchers at the Centers for Disease Control, we talked about the ITOP reports, Induced Termination of Pregnancy, and whether or not we can have a tracking system in this country. It seems at this point that that's not really possible. Uh, Dr. Hoag has a, um, put forth a proposal for a prospective study on uh, postpartum stress reactions, which is very expensive and maybe not feasible. That's why I'm arguing for why don't we use what we already have. We have the National Survey of Family Growth. We can identify women who've had miscarriages, abortions, and delivery, and we can follow back on these women and begin to collect incidents and comparison data. Thank you. Uh, I have one final question, which I want to address to you, Dr. Franz, but I'd like the other uh, members of the panel also to respond. Uh, all of you appear to me, and I hope uh, that I'm not uh, unnecessarily prematurely aging you, but all of you appear to me to be uh, of an age that, that uh, you are active professionally. Uh, or certainly have done reading about, if, if not active professionally, at the time that uh, abortions were illegal in this country. Uh, and so given the, 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 the context of this hearing, that is physical and or mental health consequences of abortions, I'll ask you where, what do you think would be the physical or mental health consequences if in fact 
abortions were again outlawed uh, and, and that the, without further I think that, that that that's the question basically okay. first of all most women who have abortions will say if you ask them they will say that had this been illegal I wouldn't have done it okay most women do, would not have illegal abortions if abortion was made illegal, most women would not, um, would not have an illegal abortion. So I think that's, that's the first point. Uh, if abortions were made illegal, I think that what you would have is the teaching effect of the law would begin to take place once again as it, as it has functioned in the past. And that is that people would realize that they were dealing with something which is illegal, that their behavior would be affected by that. We have found that if we do anything at all to discourage the use of abortion, that it has a beneficial effect on the behavior of people. The Minnesota Health Department has statistics, which I refer you to, which shows that since they introduced parental notification into their state so that the student, that, that teenagers were forced to tell their parents that not only did the abortion rate drop, but sexual activity rates dropped as well. These kids but were assume, less assuming that, that it were illegal, then you wouldn't have that kind of pre-notification. So I'm asking you, if in fact abortions were illegal, what would law, be the consequences? The law does have an effect. And okay. if it was illegal, I believe that people would monitor their behavior better. We would see a drop in, in sexual activity and a drop in uh, the need for abortion. Thank you. Dr. David? I'm afraid I could not disagree more. Uh, I think that I'd like to come back for just one second. Dr. Franz suggested that denial, which I had mentioned, was an indicator of trauma. I think that's a very good example of sincere people coming to opposite conclusions. In my view, the, the, the denial of abortion, the case of many women, represents an integration of their psychological system and, and a way of coping with it rather than the trauma itself. And as far as adolescence is concerned, uh, all the evidence from our other Western European countries shows conclusively that adolescents in Denmark and Sweden and the Netherlands are just as sexually active as adolescents in the United States, but manage not to get pregnant. There's something wrong with our system. Abortion in the final analysis, Mr. Chairman, represents a failure. It represents a failure of couple communications, failure of contraceptive usage, failure of using effective contraception, and I like to believe that our adolescents are smarter than we sometimes give them credit for, and they're certainly just as bright as youngsters in other countries. Now what happens when abortion is illegal, I think has been well demonstrated, particularly this morning by Dr. Holker in Romania, and I would like to say that just last night I looked at the latest WHO, World Health Organization, figures on on, on maternal mortality in Romania. The last year in which it was reported was 1985, and the figures were the highest in Europe. And 86% of all maternal mortality in Romania was a result of illegal abortion. As far as, as, as women not seeking illegal abortion, all the evidence points to the contrary. In our study in Czechoslovakia, which is one of the best documented on records, we found that of the total sample of women twice denied abortion, twice denied abortion for the same pregnancy, 48% of those women managed not to deliver. You cannot find a stronger motivation anywhere. In Czechoslovakia and in Romania, despite, particularly in Romania, despite severe penalties, illegal abortion is going on all over the place. History proves conclusively, Mr. Chairman, that women will not carry a pregnancy to term if they do not wish to do so, regardless of their threat to their personal freedom or to their personal health. And I, for one, having studied in this area, believe that this country should not be the first one in a long time in the West to force women to have compulsory pregnancies and to have compulsory childbirth. One country, Romania, is enough. It should be an example to the rest of us. Thank Doctors, you. thank you. Dr. Speckhard? First of all, I'd like to say that I don't believe there's any such thing as compulsory pregnancy unless it's rape. Um, secondly, I'd like to say that uh, in the case of illegal uh, 
changing abortion to be illegal, that uh, certainly fewer people would have abortions. We've seen that as it's been legalized, more and more women have, and I would expect that trend to reverse. On the other hand, uh, when abortion was illegal, physicians were performing abortions, and I would assume that physicians would continue to perform abortions illegally. I don't think that it would turn to back alley abortions. And I think that it would um, certainly force teenagers particularly and young women not to resort to abortion as a form of birth control, which is really a tragedy that that happens. Thank you. Dr. Svecko, just on the, on the point that you make as to whom people would turn to, uh, as a young prosecutor some 30 years ago, for a period of time I was in charge of investigating and prosecuting people who were performing illegal abortions. And I would tell you that the people who had medical training who were charged with performing illegal abortions had long ceased to have the capacity to perform any kind of medical uh, procedure. And for the most part, they were people who had no medical training whatsoever. It was a horrendous butchering of people. Dr. Adler? Uh, sir, we found that downtown D.C. with legal abortion as well. Uh, I don't remember the man's name, but he was a butcher, and he was legal. But I would suggest that that would be the rarest of exceptions today. Dr. Adler? I'd like to say, first on the, the uh, question of teens who do make up the majority of women who are having abortions, the one study that has been done by this by Dr. Catherine Lewis gives a very nice analysis of the adolescent's ability to reason and concludes that, that adolescents can, in fact, in consent to abortion, that they are able to reason and understand. I'll be happy to provide you that reference. The other thing is that we know a great deal about the effects of childbearing for teenagers. At that point, the script is written for their life. They're going to drop out of school, be much higher likelihood of living in poverty, have many more problems down the road. So that if abortion were made illegal, it's not only likely to cause more trauma for those who undergo illegal abortions, but would increase teenage childbearing for those who would not have access to abortion with all the, the misery that that implies for the teenager and for the children. Again, to not focus on prevention, to prevent the unwanted pregnancy, seems to me incredibly short-sighted. Nobody seeks abortion. Nobody seeks to become pregnant. Teenagers become pregnant for a variety of reasons having to do with ignorance, conflict over being sexually active, not knowing where to go, having problems with methods. They become pregnant and seek abortion as a last resort. The best we can do is to try and prevent the need for abortion. The next best thing is to make the abortion as untraumatic as possible. Thank you. Ms. Pelosi? I just would, Mr. Chairman, just like to um, draw that to a, a logical conclusion. Would all of our uh, witnesses therefore conclude that taking out what Dr. Adler just said, the best way is to prevent the need for abortion, and along with what Dr. David mentioned earlier, that psychologically speaking, if we had a strong um, program for planned parenthood in our country addressed to the needs of, of women, whatever their age, uh, that that would psychologically equip them to cope with whatever their decision was to pursue a medical option and, it, and its consequences thereafter. So would, would, Dr. Fran, uh, would our two witnesses who, not Dr. Franz, not Dr. Adler, because they've addressed that, um, agree that we should have a serious sex education and, and Planned Parenthood information for, for all, uh, all women in America? All, all Americans, actually. To Dr. Speckhardt, I, I think it's you and brief, Dr. David, uh, briefly. Um, I, I wouldn't agree that Planned Parenthood will reduce the rate of, of abortion. Is that, is that sorry, what you're saying? You're saying trouble. that information about contraception would not reduce the, data the, the we have of abortions? does not support this. All the data we have indicates... Well, okay, that answers my question, Dr. Franz, okay. because I think that, frankly, it discredits it a lot of what you said according previously. According to the studies we have. Okay. It increases the rate of abortion. Where Planned Parenthood monies are involved, there is an increase no, in the rate don't, of abortion. Let me use the term Planned Parenthood. I don't, uh, you know, perhaps we're in conflict over the terms, and I don't agree with you on that, but information about contraception. Would you support, therefore, a program of widespread education on 
contraception in order to diminish the need for abortion. Uh, thank you for clarifying the question. Um, I would not on the grounds that the research that we have now, and I can give you Kirby's study, there are a number of studies that indicate that sex education, as we're doing it now, and the provision of birth control does not change the attitudes and behavior of kids. No, I'm saying increase the communication. As we're doing it now, I'm saying As we're doing it now, it does not work. No, Do no, ma'am. I would not increase, and I would not recommend putting more money into it. As, as we're doing it now, we have no evidence that it works mm -hmm. okay. to do what you want it to do. Yeah. Okay. I'm not against sex education, and I'm not against family planning programs, but to reduce the rate of abortion, um, the evidence shows that it doesn't do that. Because we're not doing it correctly, is, is properly one. Dr. David? I, I wouldn't agree with that statement. Okay. I think there's increasing evidence that particularly school-based programs, peer counseling programs, adolescents advising each other are reducing the incidence of unwanted pregnancy. And I think that if we ever want to do anything about abortion, we have to start preventing unwanted pregnancies which create the demand for abortion. And if we are able to reduce unwanted pregnancies by whatever means, including better communication, including better sex education, including better openness about sexuality in our society. And I would submit to you that part of the problem is in our own society compared to, to the Western and Northern European countries, certainly. There's a great ambivalence about, society, about sexuality in our society. I think that's reflected here this morning. And until we as a society decide to prevent and help to reduce unwanted pregnancies, until the prevention approach is tied further, abortion incidents will not go down. But if we succeed, abortion will go down. Thank you. I, I would just like to comment that my reference to the Minnesota situation is, for me, an answer to this. In other words, in, when they asked the kids to communicate, as Dr. Davis indicated, with their parents, there was a decrease in all of the negative effects that we're talking about. And I think that we need to start looking at some of these approaches that getting kids together in their families, building family support seems to be one direction. And that, to me, is one of the strongest indicators we have that we can reduce abortion and sexual activity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank Franz. You. Mr. Chairman, I'm very concerned about this because uh, we've all been alerted to the fact that after a certain age, it, uh, it's, the danger increases for a woman uh, to have a baby. Uh, but it's also important to note that below a certain age, there are additional dangers to a, a young woman having a baby if she is below 15 or 16 years of age. So we're not just talking psychologically, philosophically, we're talking medically, health-wise, etc. There's so many reasons why I hope that our committee will take heed of Dr. David's um, testimony uh, here today, not only for psychological reasons, but uh, for healthier babies and, and decreasing the mortality rate of babies in America, especially when the funding doesn't seem to be there for prenatal or neonatal uh, care as well. Uh, I thank our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ms. Pelosi. And I also want to thank all of our witnesses on this panel for your excellent testimony today and for taking time from your busy schedules to be with us. If any of you have some, uh, any additional ideas about the kinds of research that the federal government should be funding, I want to invite you to provide the subcommittee with those proposals or suggestions within the next week or two so that we can include it in the hearing record. Again, our thanks for your participation. Our final panel of witnesses is from the United States Department of Health and Human Services. They include Dr. C. Everett Koop, the Surgeon General, Dr. Ralph Reed, Acting Assistant Secretary for Health, and Dr. Duane Alexander, Director of the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development of NIH. And um, I understand that uh, Mr. Walter and Dr. Hogue will also be joining you, Mr. Surgeon General Dr. Koop. And would you all stand uh, behind the chairs in front of which your nameplates are uh, placed and if you will, before sitting down, raise your right hand.
Do you and each of you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? It is. Let the record indicate that each of the witnesses has responded in the affirmative. <clears throat> Again, let me express my appreciation to each of you uh, for your participation today. Uh, we'd like to ask each of you to, uh, who will be testifying, Dr. Coop and Dr. Reed, uh, to try to limit your testimony to about six minutes, uh, and we'll have your entire statements entered into the record. And before we begin, uh, let me indicate how pleased we are to have the Surgeon General with us. Dr. Coop, you've been truly an outstanding public servant and Surgeon General have not been reluctant to take on some of the most controversial issues of our time and to call it as you see it. And I think that the nation uh, owes its gratitude to you for the <coughs> role that you have played during the course of your service as Surgeon General. And we would, we're, I think, now ready to hear your testimony and then Dr. Reed's. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will present to you this morning uh, the process that we use to investigate the health effects of abortion on women. On July 30th, 1987, President Reagan stated that he thought women were not being informed about the health effects of abortion on women, and the President directed the Surgeon General to assemble a body of information on the health effects of abortion on women. Let me make it very clear, Mr. Chairman, that our charge from the President and our deliberations, as well as any conclusions we drew, had and have nothing to do with the safety of any abortion procedure for the woman. Rather, our focus was on health effects post-abortion, be that weeks, months, or years. My staff and I decided <clears throat> that we would undertake this project in the same manner we did with the Surgeon General's report on AIDS. We reviewed the available literature on the health effects of abortion on women, and consulted experts in the fields of science, medicine, psychology, and public health. I met privately with 27 different groups that had medical, philosophical, or psychosocial expertise or other professional interests in abortion. The process involved groups such as the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, uh, the Alan Guttmacher Institute, the American Public Health Association, American College of Obstetricians, Gynecologists, <coughs> Southern Baptists, Catholic Bishops, um, etc., as well as groups of women uh, who have had psychological and social difficulties that they felt were related to abortion. When I met with each of these groups before or during the meeting, I informed them that although the meeting was being recorded, their conversations would not be used for anything other than internal review of what they said. <clears throat> that are the grounds for my objection to the request to have these transcripts turned over to this subcommittee. If the Surgeon General cannot assure his consultant's confidentiality, the benefits of honest and uninhibited consultation will cease. After we met with representatives of the several organizations, my staff followed up with various participants for further consultation. Those consulted were pro-life and pro-choice and <coughs> constituted an unofficial consulting group upon whom we relied for information in the areas of OBGYN, psychology, theology, family planning data, and contraceptive methods. Initially, two types of reports were considered, a scientific document directed toward academia or perhaps a pamphlet for public consumption similar to the one entitled The Surgeon General's Report, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Review of published studies on the psychological sequelae of abortion by statisticians at NCHS and CDC indicated that the methodology in virtually all of those studies was seriously flawed. Our studies regarding the psychological outcomes of abortion could not be conclusive for several reasons. One, the lack of consensus regarding the symptoms, the severity and duration of adverse mental reactions post-abortion. Two, the lack of controls for psychological symptoms or disorders associated with life events experienced before or after the abortion. Three, the methodological difficulties related to sampling uh, to form an appropriate study group. <coughs> Four, finding a technique to surmount the fact that as many as half the women who have had abortions are likely to deny it on a questionnaire. And finally, the paucity of long-term follow-up on post-abortion women. 
Because the reports of studies of psychological effects would not permit it, we could not re prepare a report that could withstand scientific and statistical scrutiny. It was decided that I would so inform the President with an explanatory letter rather than with a report. Secretary Bowen and I delivered the letter to the White House on January 9, 1989, and on January 10, I informed my staff that no further work on the abortion study was necessary and directed them to close the files. A draft of an early attempt at a report which Commander Walter had prepared, I rejected before I decided to write the letter to the President. I thought it went beyond the President's charge. While I was preparing the letter to the President over several weeks, Commander Walter continued to draft another report of the information we had gathered. It was submitted to me on January 17. I did not read it until I received the request to testify before this committee. My letter to the President focused on psychological effects of abortion because obstetricians and gynecologists had long since concluded that the physical sequelae of abortion were no different than those found in women who carried pregnancy to term or who had never been pregnant. I had nothing further to add to that subject in my letter to the President. I have personally counseled women post-abortion who have had serious reactions to abortion, so I know that they do exist. I also have known women who claim positive health effects, so I know that they exist. However, the data from the literature at this time are insufficient scientifically and statistically with adequate controls to support the premise that abortion does or does not produce a specific post-abortion syndrome. There has never been a statistically viable prospective study on a cohort of women of childbearing age that would yield information on the effects of abortion on women. To do such a study would be credible to both sides of the, and which would be credible to both sides of the abortion argument would consume a great deal of time and would be very expensive. You asked for comments, Mr. Chairman, on a prevention strategy. Simply put, the only way to prevent adverse health effects of abortion is to prevent the abortions themselves. Most abortions would not take place if pregnancies were not unplanned and unwanted. Therefore, it seems that effort should be directed towards whatever means would minimize the number of one unwanted and unplanned pregnancies. First of all, young people should be told very explicitly that sexual activity carries with it risks not only of pregnancy, but also of sexually transmitted disease. Further information would include the understanding of contraception. It is significant that the median age of women having an abortion is about 23.4 years, with a median education of 12.7 years. There's no doubt that they would understand what we are talking about. Obviously, expansion of research into reproduction and male and female contraception would complement such an endeavor. It would be important to classify methods of birth control that are truly contraceptive and not abortifacient because a large segment of the population has no compunction about using true contraception but would be opposed to birth control if the method is abortifacient. It is worth mentioning, sir, that the first press release by a wire service after my visit to the White House completely misinterpreted my letter to the President. The release implied that there was no evidence of health effects post-abortion rather than saying there was insufficient scientific and statistical evidence on which to base an unimpeachable report. That erroneous news release was picked up by all three major networks and repeated verbatim. Since then, the incorrect conclusions have surfaced periodically and have been used improperly to further notions sincerely held by those on one side or the other of the abortion argument. I would like to make it clear that the letter I wrote to the President did not eliminate his question on psychological sequelae. It merely postponed the answer. One last comment. I have been criticized by a segment of the press for not addressing the health effects of abortion on the fetus. It was not what I was charged to study. I was asked by President Reagan to look at the health effects of abortion on women, and that is what I did. The consequences to the fetus are undeniable. I'd be glad to answer your question, sir. Thank you, Dr. Koop. Dr. Reed? Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm Dr. Ralph Reed, Acting Assistant Secretary for Health. I'm accompanied today by Dr. Dwayne Alexander, Director of the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, 
and Dr. Carol Hogue, Director of the Division of Reproductive Health at the Centers for Disease Control, uh, Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. We're here to provide a brief summary of public health service activities related to research on the health and mental health effects of abortion on women. <coughs> PHS research bearing on this issue is supported primarily through NICHD, one of the institutes of the National Institute of Health, and to a lesser degree, the Office of Population Affairs. PHS also has a role in conducting epidemiologic research and collecting and analyzing statistics related to abortions through CDC. Let me begin with a brief summary of our data collection activities. We collect and analyze information about numbers of abortions and characteristics of women obtaining abortions and data related to abortion deaths. Answering the question of how many abortions actually take place is not easy. At present, state requirements for reporting legal abortions are not consistent, and not all state health departments have mechanism for obtaining abortion data. Data from states that maintain detailed records are collected and published by the National Center for Health Statistics. The CDC has collected state-based abortion statistics continuously since 1969. These are published in the Morbidity and Mortality Week Weekly Report and in more detail, including characteristics of women obtaining abortions in the MMWR surveillance reports. Unfortunately, however, state reporting systems are not uniform, so statistics sometimes are difficult to compare. Despite these limitations, we have been able to estimate that approximately one and a half million abortions are performed annually. <coughs> Nationwide statistics are a valuable start in identifying trends in abortion, including the types of abortions and the number of abortions in various areas of the country. In addition to providing these kinds of general information about abortions, statistics collected nationwide and with some uniformity also permit a focus on some particular population subgroups, which, while they may constitute small percentages of the total population of women having abortions, nevertheless present special concerns. One example of this is abortions which occur in the second or third trimester of pregnancy. While these represent only about 10% of all abortions, they present a special concern. Women who have abortions after the first trimester are more than four times as likely to suffer major immediate medical complications as women obtaining abortions in the first trimester of pregnancy. By tracking information on timing of abortion, we're able to report that every year a smaller proportion of abortions occur after the first trimester. Pregnancy and abortions in very young women, those under 15, are of a special concern, especially because 56% of pregnancies in women under 15 result in abortion. However, statistically, this is a difficult group of women to study without good data because it, because it is, again, a small proportion of the population, representing less than 1% of all abortions. Research supported by both NIH and the Adolescent Family Life Program looks at how best to address the problems occasioned by early sexual activity and its sequelae of which abortion is one. Another important aspect of abortion is the extent to which women who have had a number of unwanted pregnancies have multiple abortions. According to statistics published recently, Approximately 5% of abortions were to women who had had three or more previous abortions. We're concerned about the health effects of abortion on all women, but this latter group clearly presents a set of special concerns. We need good reporting and statistical analysis to understand what is happening in population subgroups such as this. Approximately 40% of abortions in 1985 were performed on women who had at least one previous abortion. We're very concerned about multiple abortions. The most serious potential medical consequence to a woman who's had an abortion is, of course, maternal death. The CDC investigates each report of an abortion-related death. And from these investigations, we determine, for example, in there, in, that in 1985, there were six deaths related to legal abortions. This represents one death from legal abortion per 200,000 reported legal abortions. This small rate 
is reflective of both the trend to early or abortion and safer procedures. Concerns such as these mentioned, as well as a variety of other important issues, can be addressed best when we understand both the nature and the extent of the situation. This points to the importance of improved reporting of abortions, to understand how abortion practices are changing, and to establish a framework for research, we need accurate statistics on abortion by characteristics of the woman and of the abortion procedure. This is why we're hopeful that while working with the states, we can achieve both more comprehensive and more uniform reporting. In addition to PHS efforts to monitor patterns of legal abortion, PHS also supports research on the antecedents and consequences of abortion. For example, NICHD has a broad research program on fertility. This research program is studying abortions obtained by teenagers and is also supporting Dr. Henry David's study of abortion in Denmark, a country with a unique health care registration system that facilitates such research. We're also study, we also study abortion in the context of contraceptive use and fertility. For example, the National Fertility Surveys historically have included pregnancy histories as part of measuring contraceptive use, contraceptive effectiveness, and the consequences of fertility-related <laughs> behavior. The most recent of these surveys was completed in 1988 by the National Center for Health Statistics, and the data will be available shortly. The survey will include a 21-month follow-up to monitor short-term changes in fertility-related behavior. While this project does not measure abortion morbidity, and the survey is not designed to assess the psychological sequelae of abortion, this and other studies NICHD supports help us put abortion into context of contraceptive and fertility decisions. Another significant PHS effort related to abortion is the Adolescent Family Life Program administered by the Office of Population Affairs. It is clear that among adolescents there was an increase in sexual activity through the 1970s, although recent data indicate a leveling off. The higher levels of sexual activity mean more teens are at greater risk of unwanted pregnancy than in previous years. The Adolescent Family Life Program funds research on the causes and consequences of teen sexual activity in pregnancy. In addition, it supports demonstration projects to help teens postpone sexual activity and provides support services to help teen, teens through crisis pregnancies, including promoting adoption as a positive alternative to abortion. Other of our studies have shown that women who seek elective abortions are often women who use contraceptives, but who had a period of non-use leading to an unwanted pregnancy. This makes our programs of research on the practice of contraception and our education programs related to the risks of sexual activity especially important. We must understand how and why women and couples who are inclined to use methods of contraception confront problems with that use which leave them exposed to the risk of unintended pregnancy. There are ongoing programs of research to develop new and better approaches to contraception and to address the problems couples face in using the methods already available. In 1986, the NICHD Contraceptive Development Initiative was begun. This presented a plan for accelerated research on both the biomedical and behavioral aspects of contraception. While there are many areas of disagreement about abortion, the high levels of abortion in the U.S. today are indicative of the need to continue to assess the difficulties associated with the use of contraceptives. Clearly, research in this area should continue. As Dr. Koop mentioned, some have suggested a single comprehensive assessment of the health effects, including physical and psychological effects of abortion, and such a study would be an enormous un undertaking. Ideally, it would involve the study of a large number of women, prospectively, over a significant period of time, perhaps five to ten years. A range of cost, size, and depth for such a study can be envisioned. Many believe that new psychological instruments may have to be developed and standardized. Moreover, while such a study could answer a range of questions about abortion and other reproductive events, it is unlikely that a single study, no matter how comprehensive and how carefully designed, would answer all questions about abortion. CDC, under the auspices of the Public Health Service, convened a meeting last year to discuss with outside consultants the feasibility of this kind of study. They agreed with our own assessment that such a study would be extremely costly 
and methodologically very difficult. Abortion is a complex issue, and the solutions are likely to be complex as well. We are committed to improving data systems so that we will know the extent and nature of abortion in the U.S. today and over time. Our society must continue to provide alternatives to abortion. Alternatives range from the avoidance of early sexual experiences to better use of current contraceptives to improve methods of contraception, to support services during pregnancy, and to adoption as an alternative to abortion for women faced with unintended pregnancy. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Reed. Um, again, during the questioning, uh, we will limit each member uh, to 10 minutes on any particular round so that all the members may have the opportunity <coughs> to ask questions. And although the questions will be directed to Dr. Coop or Dr. Reed, uh, any of the others on the panel who feel or whom uh, Dr. Coop or Dr. Reed feel could supply additional information, uh, your participation, of course, would be welcome. And I think that perhaps before we start, uh, Dr. Coop, the one person who was not fully identified was Commander Walter, and perhaps we could have <coughs> description of his role. In an effort to save time, sir, I skipped that. Uh, Commander Walter uh, has been my personal assistant uh, in the abortion study and is here with me this morning. Good. Thank you so much. <coughs> Dr. Coop, uh, let me ask you first about your role in the preparation of the draft report that was provided to the subcommittee. Uh, prior to the actual writing of the report, you personally met with a large number of researchers and advocates, as you indicated in your testimony. Is that correct? That's correct. And in your testimony, you explained that you had seen an earlier version or versions of the report. And I assume that you were involved to the extent that you discussed at least some aspects of the earlier drafts with your staff, and they responded to your suggestions for changes or amendments, is that correct? That is correct. Um, let me, first off, although you, you indicated in your testimony that uh, you had on January 10th uh, suggested or, or directed, really, that the files be closed, and then said that on January 17th you received uh, a report uh, from Mr. Commander Walter. Uh, let me, for the record, uh, enter in at this point the cover letter uh, with that report addressed to you. Um, and Commander Walter, you let me know if, in fact, this is accurate. It says that the stamp date on it is January 17, 1989. Um, and the type portion says, Policy and Program Advisor, Office of the Surgeon General, Final Draft Abortion Report, the Surgeon General. The attached document is my final draft of the, quote, prevention, close quote, report. This document was reviewed and concurred with by our unofficial consulting group. It represents a balanced, well-written document which is directed to the general public. Its underpinning is scientifically sound and presents a solid, common sense approach to this important public health problem. It has your printed name, uh, George Walter, and then it says uh, Suzanne Dorman, I guess it is written in for George Walter, an attachment. Now that's, that's an accurate uh, recitation of the covering letter of the document to the Surgeon General. Is that correct, Mr. Yes, Walter? Sir. Okay. Dr. Coop, that, that draft of the report uh, concludes that physical health problems such as infertility, miscarriage, and ectopic pregnancy, quote, are no more frequent among women who experienced abortion than they are among the general population of women, close quote. Several of our witnesses agreed with that conclusion earlier this morning, and your testimony this morning also supports that conclusion. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. According to an article published by several CDC scientists in 1982, 
women are seven times more likely to die in childbirth than as a result of abortions. A July 1987 article in the American Journal of Public Health concludes that women are 25 times more likely to die in childbirth than as a result of abortions. And earlier this morning, Dr. Hulka estimated that the risk was at least 10 times greater for childbirth compared to abortion. Uh, Dr. Hoag, do you have any reason to question the validity of these statistical estimates? No, sir. Dr. Koop, was that significant comparison of mortality rates reported to the President in your letter? No, sir, it was not, and I would call your attention to what I said in my testimony. We were not concerned in this report with the safety uh, or the consequences immediately of the abortion procedure. We were seeking to uh, identify and evaluate <coughs> both physical and psychological uh, events that took place post-abortion and might have been caused by that abortion. The draft report emphasizes that preventing unwanted pregnancies is a goal that virtually everyone can support. Uh, let me quote the, the, the language. Not enough is known about why men and women who have decided to become sexually active are willing to risk unintended pregnancy and the possibility of resolution by abortion when safe and effective family planning methods are available. Close quote. Do you agree with that statement? And if so, do you think that HHS should help to decrease unintended pregnancy by encouraging the correct, correct use of contraceptives? Uh, I'd like, like to make the caveat, sir, that the report we are discussing uh, was Commander Walter's report. Um, it does not uh, in any way contain any finishing touches, corrections, whatever that I might have placed upon it. Right. And so I distance myself from that, not because it might be an incorrect report, but just for the sake of having the record correct. Uh, as far as the second part of your question, uh, my testimony this morning has already implied that I think we have to move uh, in the direction of such education. Right. And do you have any suggestions uh, as to what HHS should be doing? What, what should be doing, sir? What the Health and Human Services Department should be doing along these lines? Well, I, I think it would be a mistake to just look at contraception uh, as an easy fix uh, for the problems of abortion. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in passing and does not appear in my written testimony, I think you have to start earlier. Uh, you are well aware of the um, controversy that uh, I raised in reference to AIDS when I said that uh, children should understand their own sexuality earlier than they now do. And if you're going to be talking about such things uh, as a fatal disease such as AIDS, uh, as such a thing as pregnancy with all of its consequences, I think it makes very good sense uh, that that type of education be undertaken. I think that many of the controversies that occur around it can be straightened out First of all, if parents would assume their rightful obligation and privilege to do that, if they would work with schools instead of fighting them, if they would work with their own civic communities and their churches, so that we could come up with a curriculum that would teach youngsters uh, what the values are of family life, respect for one's own body and another person's body, and to teach these things in a caring, kind, considerate uh, manner. I do believe it's possible to raise a generation of pre-adolescents who might be less sexually active than the present generation of adolescents. So I would start there. Beyond that point, then I think you have to have uh, contraceptive uh, education. And uh, whenever one starts in that, I think there should be a concomitant uh, research program <clears throat> that investigates to the fullest extent possible both male and female contraceptive methods. And uh, as I also alluded to in my testimony, it's extremely important uh, that the public know the difference between abortifacient uh, and contraceptive methods of birth control because those who favor birth control uh, are sharply divided on the methods whereby this should be accomplished. Therefore, I think full and frank discussion of that is also important. And uh, I think that uh, as one developed this program of education, uh, which it all is, 
sexual education for youngsters, education about contraceptives for those that are sexually active. Uh, I think that uh, other avenues of innovative and creative uh, education would make themselves obvious and should be followed. I, I assume also that in the first part of your response, when you were talking about the increased role or responsibility that the family should be assuming, uh, that in fact you were supporting uh, increased voluntary family planning services. Um, and if so, how do you think that HHS can help to ensure that such services are widely available? <clears throat> well, let me go back to my previous life, sir, and remind you that uh, I was in the practice of pediatrics as a surgeon for 35 years. I discussed these issues uh, very commonly with the parents of my patients. I don't think I ever found a parent who didn't believe that the uh, sexual education and human development education of his or her child was not only his obligation but his privilege. But the fact of the matter is that very few parents follow through on their beliefs on this subject. And uh, therefore, the reason that I suggested that this be combined uh, with um, families, churches, community, uh, and school. As one <coughs> progresses uh, beyond that initial education of youngsters uh, and gets up into uh, the teenage years, uh, just as we have to talk to them about the problems of sexually transmitted disease, of which AIDS is one and fatal, I think they have to understand the risks of becoming sexually active as that pertains to pregnancy. I think they have to be told that uh, it isn't just a simple decision when you get pregnant, that uh, the problems uh, that uh, a teenager faces uh, in decisions are not just should I get rid of this pregnancy or should I not, but the consequences that might exist from either one of those decisions. So I am all for the fullest and most frank discussion of these issues for youngsters at that sexually active age. Uh, consonant with uh, the responses that you've just been giving, the re report also states that, quote, we must promote a national commitment to contraceptive research for both men and women. The objective should be a method that is 100% effective has minimal side effects and is safe and easy to use, close quote. Most Americans, I think, would agree with that. But do you have specific suggestions about how to implement that goal through research funding priorities? Uh, <clears throat> no, I can't say that I do, sir. The, these are not my functions in the Department of Health and Human Services or the Public Health Service. But I think one should uh, say, as uh, in passing, that uh, what Commander Walter wrote there is an ideal which we have never found. And you've heard in previous testimony from the previous panel that even those who do use contraceptives uh, have difficulty in always making them work. Uh, and we know that people who are on contraceptives for two years, that approximately 10% of them become pregnant. So uh, Commander Walter's position is well taken that the ideal would be to find something more effective uh, than the present systems. Thank you very much. Ms. Pelosi? Something's happening here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for their testimony. I particularly want to thank Dr. Koop uh, for his leadership on the AIDS issue as a, a Surgeon General. Uh, I mailed the Surgeon General's report to my district. It was very, very well received. It's a valuable resource to us, so I thank you for thank that you. and for all that you have done. Dr. Coop, today we're talking about something so personal, striking right to the heart of, of us as, as families, as human beings, and how we relate to each other and the rest. And I can't help but think that although your question was a very specific one from the President, that talking about the psychological effects of, of abortion on a woman, a, the, a recommendation back to include the widest range of options being made available to a woman wouldn't be an appropriate response because it, as previous witnesses have testified and as we know um, if it is a decision and you have reasons why you conclude a certain thing then of course you have probably a better comfort level with your decision as, a, as, a, as unpleasant as the decision may be. 
uh, I guess I have a little difficulty in your response to Chairman Weiss's question about all of the attitudes that you describe that we should have both as family members and both in terms of public policy, but that there is no funding priority or anything that, since you were asked the question, that, that uh, you perhaps could not have come back with. I understand it's not specifically your job, but it is not unrelated to the question. Well, I, th I thought that I had answered both aspects of your question. Uh, I thought that my response to the President and his question uh, implied that because of the problems of unwanted and unplanned pregnancies and the need for education and to prevent those carried all the things that you've mentioned. And uh, as far as the uh, uh, further research uh, in these efforts, I think that's also implied there. And uh, Dr. Alexander would have to tell you uh, in more specific detail uh, that uh, what we are doing, it's my impression that we're not silent on the subject, but there's always room for improvement. Right, I guess instead of implying, it would, I, I, since it's such an important issue, I just wondered why you wouldn't use something stronger than an implication about what should be done or what the possibilities were. Well, I, again, uh, if I might defend myself, um, I was trying to make this <coughs> letter uh, comprehensive but also readable by the President, and uh, I did suggest uh, <laughs> an ongoing study uh, that would be uh, beneficial uh, in the totality of our concerns and I would think that such a prospective study would uh, begin to bring out all sorts of questions that would demand answers. I hope so. Do you th I think included in that might be uh, pursuing uh, the possibility for um, the development of our uh, or use of RU uh, 486 in the United States? Uh, I don't know what those studies would take. Um, this administration already has a, um, a firm position on, on RU-486, and uh, I don't know what direction such uh, studies within the department would take. Well, do you think that if, um, if what we're trying to do is, if, the, if abortion is the inevitable option that some women conclude they must uh, have, uh, that, and we're hearing that uh, obviously the earlier the better, that this wouldn't be considered the earliest of all possibilities of post um, um. Well, it goes back to the answer I made previously, and that is <clears throat> there are a great many people out there that uh, are concerned about birth control. Mm -hmm. um, they are for birth control, but they're not for methods of birth control that are not contraceptive but are abortifacient. And I think most people would classify uh, RU486 as an abortifacient. And I think the more education we have on all of these things, the better able are people uh, to come to a decision about their own moral, ethical, and religious beliefs and transmit those to people such as you who make the laws. Do you think that RU486 is in every case abortifacient? Um, I'd have to refer that to real scientists over here. I'm just a doctor. But um, it's my impression that that is the case. I mean, I, th I think it's a very troubling issue. As, as a Catholic, I have five children of my own, four daughters, and uh, for my son's sake as well, I hope that science and the church and public policy and uh, public attitudes will one day look back on this and say this was a 50-year period or so, or maybe not that long in our history, when uh, our needs were not met in, in, by each other, by science, by public policy, and that uh, there will be some compatibility with the church and public policy and the right of a woman to make a decision about her future. And if we're talking about today the psychological effects of that, uh, that, uh, that part of the psychological effect is it's her decision and somebody else's religious beliefs shouldn't be a part of her religious beliefs as she makes that decision. And um, something like RU486, which um, which I'm not advocating necessarily. I just think it's a better, it appears to be a better option than a, an abortion at a later uh, stage, um, that we might open up the possibilities uh, that who knows where science uh, may, may lead us on it. In any case, I appreciate what you have said, and uh, I, I think it points out that, that um, we have to make a stronger national decision about uh, our education program. I, may I assume that you agree with Dr. David uh, in all that he said about the education program? With Dr. David? Mm -hmm. uh, 
Well, I'd have to read over everything oh, he, he said it. rather than give you a blanket yes on that. Well, I meant his recommendation at the very end when he said that, uh, that abortion represented a failure in the, in the, in the system. Oh, I, I think one of, the, one of the most impressive things to me in conducting uh, this study for the president uh, was the fact that uh, practically everybody that we met with, uh, whether they were to the far uh, side of pro-choice or the far side of pro-life all agreed that abortion is a failure. It's a failure on some part of the support system, some part of the educational system, and I think that's a very good place to begin. Do you find it ironic that some of the very people who are most opposed to abortion as a medical option also oppose um, uh, education, uh, sex education and uh, education on the use of contraception? Uh, I, don't, I don't find it, uh, you know, unusual. I think that uh, we're dealing with uh, an issue, abortion itself, uh, which has divided our people uh, in this country probably as no issue has since the days of slavery. Uh, there's practically no aspect of abortion that you can discuss, whether it's 486 or teaching your children to be sexually abstinent so they won't get pregnant, that isn't going to raise the hackles of a large part of our population. And uh, that's one of the problems of abortion. <clears throat> and I think it came out very clearly in the previous panel when some questions were asked, why aren't these things being done? people avoid many issues that have to do with abortion because when you get into this situation, you come eventually down to the point where your own bias on the social, moral, ethical issue of abortion comes into play. And it's uh, been very difficult for um, most people who have tried to study this field objectively to walk that tightrope of a bias-free decision. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Coop. Dr. Hogue, earlier uh, Dr. Grimes testified in, in a previous panel, I don't know whether you were here at the time, uh, but he um, mentioned that when he was at CDC, uh, he had, there was some difficulty there and that, that and he mentioned, in fact, uh, that one of the reasons that he was unhappy there was because of censorship of a document that he was putting together. Could you address that, Dr. Hogue? No, I was a staff epidemiologist at that time. I've um, be been director of the Reproductive Health Division for only a short time, um, so I really am not in a position to address that. Dr. Reed, would you know anything about that? Congresswoman, I didn't understand the question. Your voice is very soft. And I'm sorry, says... Dr. Grimes, who, was te who testified earlier, uh, who was formerly at CDC, testified to us that in a document he was putting together, uh, that at CDC there was censorship of that doc document in terms of the use of the word abortion and in some discussion of contraception. Are you familiar with that? I never heard of him until this morning, Congresswoman. So, no. uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, is it possible that perhaps Dr. Hogue could find out for us from um, CDC uh, exactly what the problem was there? Well, we can request that, that she attempt to find an institutional response and to submit it to for the for the subcommittee's hearing record. Yes, sir. Thank you. My, I believe my time has expired on this round, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pelosi. Mr. Payne. Thank you. Uh, just um, earlier, uh, Dr. Coopy heard um, several of the panelists indicate that, in their opinion, uh, family planning dollars had been wasted because there were still pregnancies and unwanted pregnancies and abortion. And I would wonder uh, uh, what your feeling is about that. Evidently, those persons making that statement may be uh, unaware that, that times are changing and because you still have numbers of pregnancies, in my opinion, that doesn't necessarily mean, therefore, the money has been wasted. It could be twice as many, for example, but evidently this isn't taken into account. I wonder what, what your um, um, feelings are as relates to uh, money spent, as you mentioned, in education and family planning, et cetera. I, I think that's an extraordinarily difficult question uh, to answer, sir, or I understand why you ask it. Um, in order to answer it uh, honestly and truthfully and without bias, I'd have to know, you know, how the money was spent, who spent it, what the obligations were, what the expectations were, and what kind of evaluation you could make on it. Um, that might take an awful long time, and, and uh, I really can't answer it. Mm -hmm. 
the um, at how early an age uh, do you feel that the um, this education should begin? We've also heard uh, some earlier panelists say that they felt that uh, teenagers were too young to make a proper decision as related to uh, uh, choosing an option. Uh, of course, if they decided to have the child, they would then have the responsibility of raising the child, but that seems to escape their minds. I wonder what, how early would you think that it is um, uh, that, that this education uh, should begin? Well, again, uh, I always preface my remarks with this very difficult question to answer because all children um, do not grow uh, and mature developmentally at the same rate that they age chronologically. And therefore, we should be not talking so much about chronological age, but developmental age. And uh, that's what I'm usually talking about uh, when I say these things. The second caveat that I would mention is that I think people confuse education about contraception, education about abortion, education about AIDS, with the necessary preliminary education about what you are, how you got there, what your reactions would be, what your body's like, what your relationship to people might be, and then you move into the tougher questions. So that I have taken the position ever since the AIDS controversy that uh, for toddlers you answer their questions. Children from two to six only want to know two things. Where did I come from and why do I look different than my brother or sister? Answer those questions. From two to six, they have a total silence. When they come back at nine, their questions are so sophisticated their parents run for cover. And that's one of the problems with sex education. And that's why families and schools and communities should be doing something because they may not think that children are being educated, but they are by their friends, by television, by magazines, and by everything that goes on in life. They are very smart kids when they're nine. Now, that is not yet necessarily age either to talk about AIDS or STDs uh, or pregnancy, but developmentally that's the age you could begin thinking about it and you introduce each of those at a time it's necessary. But you have to recognize that we have always been too late in assuming the proper age to teach our kids anything. The studies that we've done on smoking are, are a beautiful example. We tell you before committees such as this that people start to smoke when they're 13, but they make the decision to smoke when they're 10. So if you want to prevent them from smoking, you start talking when they're seven. And so I think all those things pertain to this. But it's very important that we don't get the public upset about sex education by letting them think we're going to start talking to their kids in the first grade about pregnancy, abortion, and sodomy, because that's not what we're going to do. Uh, well, wouldn't a, uh, a sensible approach be perhaps to start, maybe even simultaneously, though, with the education to the parents, as they seem to be the problem? Uh, do you have any ideas on how we can get them to understand that maybe we need to do this when they're four or five or six? Yes, sir. Every, ever since the controversy arose over my uh, statements about the need for uh, understanding one's own sexuality in reference to AIDS, I have been pushing from every pulpit I could find the need for a three-pronged educational system for kids where there is a teacher's manual, a child's textbook, but a family syllabus so that they know what their children are about to uh, face in school and what a marvelous time for them to interject whatever discordant uh, moral, ethical, or religious views they may have to bring their kids in conformity to what they believe. And uh, there are such curricula now available, and I just hope they spread. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Dr. Coop, let me now focus on that aspect of uh, your response to President Reagan that your letter covered, that is the psychological impact of abortion on women. According to your testimony today and your letter to President Reagan, scientists from several public health service agencies reviewed the major studies of the psychological impact of abortion on women and concluded that all are methodologically flawed and therefore cannot support conclusions one way or the other. Is that correct? 
That's what I was told, sir. I am not a statistician. Okay. Now, in 1987, representatives of the National Right to Life Committee, including two of our previous witnesses, gave you a white paper on the psychological impact of abortion. They claimed it was, quote, one of the most comprehensive and analytical documents that have been presented to date on this topic, close quote. However, your consultants from three HHS agencies and a non-federal consultant all severely criticized this white paper for misrepresenting data, misusing statistical analyses, and other major shortcomings. One reviewer said that the paper, quote, deserves a little recognition, close quote. Another said that the meta-analysis has, quote, no value, close quote. The reviewers said that much of the research cited as proving psychological harm was very similar to research that the, pa that the paper itself criticized as severely flawed. Were you able to find any scientifically valid research to support the position that abortion has severe psychological effects on a significant number of women? The problem is in your statements are a significant number. Right. As I've said in my testimony, uh, and uh, as I think uh, I mentioned a few moments ago, um, there's no doubt about the fact that there are those people uh, who do have uh, severe psychological problems after abortion. I have counseled such people in my own life. I also mentioned people at the other end of the scale uh, whose relief uh, over an unwanted pregnancy uh, brings them uh, a situation which they consider to be of good mental health. Now, anecdotes uh, do not make a scientific uh, material. Uh, and if you notice that the words I used were scientifically and statistically with proper controls. That is my obligation to the public, to the president, to you uh, as the Surgeon General, uh, not to mistake things that I see and know are there with a statistical analysis that presents you with a report uh, on which you can act. And so, with that caveat, uh, I would say that I did not see, either singly or in the aggregate, um, any um, body of information that satisfied all the things that I thought were necessary for a scientific report. Were consultants from CDC, NCHS, or NICHD asked to review the articles concluding that abortion does not have severe psychological impact. That it does not have any. Right. Yes, they reviewed those in the group. Which, which, which article, sir? Uh, the, the, there is reference to the fact that there are some 270 uh, articles which address the issue of uh, abortion having psychological impacts. And the question is whether consultants from CDC, NCHS, or NICHD were asked by the Surgeon General, the Surgeon General's office, to review the articles concluding that abortion does not have severe psychological impact. They were not asked to review 250 articles. Uh, were, we, I, I principally reviewed the articles uh, when we had articles. Commander, would you pull the microphone closer to you, maybe even sure. push the button if it's, if, to oh, see if it's on? The um, reports were principally reviewed by me, the 250 articles that are spoken to earlier. Those articles which we thought uh, raised possibilities or had questions or needed uh, some resolution, then we contacted each of the agencies uh, where there was an appropriate expertise. Well, now, are you saying that, that there were some of these reports that you asked the CDC or NCHS or NICHD in fact to review? I don't understand the question. I thought that your response to me just now said that you sort of took a, an overview yourself of That's the correct. entire field of articles and then as you felt that some of the articles required expert comment that you then referred them 
to the respective ag or, or, or particular agency. And I'm trying to ascertain whether, in fact, that's, that, that that's the correct, correct interpretation on my part of your response. No, that is correct. Okay, now, in a review of the documents that your office provided to our subcommittee, there were no evaluations by public health service consultants of any studies except the right to life white paper, which indeed happened to contain Dr. David's study. Uh, now, does that refresh your recollection, or can you tell us why, if in fact you asked them to review, uh, why the evaluations would not appear in the materials which were forwarded to us, which, which your office said included all the materials you had on this subject? That, that's correct. Uh, my conversations with uh, CDC, NCHS would have been verbal. You mean you, uh, you, su you submitted certain reports to them for their review? No. Asked them to analyze them? And then instead of asking them to report their evaluation to you in writing, you, tell, you had a telephone conversation with them? Sir, the, the only report that was submitted uh, to anyone was the white paper you refer to from NCHS. Other reports or studies, I would use the term studies, not reports, uh, were simply articles in the literature which I had a question on. The only white paper that we submitted, again, was the one from the National Right to Life on meta-analysis. That's the only white White paper. white paper. Is that the only study or the only article that you, you it's submitted? It's study in the sense of a piece of original work that was submitted to us, yes, sir. So that uh, none of these other 250 studies uh, were submitted to any of the PHS agencies, is that correct? Not as individual studies, that's correct. Were they sent as, a, as, an, as a, an aggregate group? No, sir. They weren't sent at all? No, not at all. Okay. Now, if the study's finding no severe psychological impact, which is what these 250 or so studies uh, were about, were not reviewed by public health service scientists, Dr. Coop or Dr. Walter, Commander Walter, please explain the statement in Dr. Coop's letter to the president and your testimony today that <coughs> quote, all major studies had been reviewed by PHS scientists and found to be flawed. Well, I'm one, he's one, scientist, I mean. And uh, I don't think that you have to submit every uh, paper that you read uh, to uh, analysis by other people. Um, it's obvious to people such as uh, I and to Commander Walter that some uh, methodologies are flawed. It's obvious that some conclusions uh, are improperly drawn. The reason that we had the specific uh, consultation about the white paper is in, in question is for the very reason uh, that uh, you presented it in the manner that you did. It was uh, presented to us uh, as the answer to all of the problems that we were concerned about. Uh, it didn't seem that way to Commander Walter and to me, and that's why we sought the expert advice about that. We didn't think that the other papers that we looked at were uh, that complicated to make decisions about, although when we did talk with people from uh, the agencies, uh, we did, as Commander Walter has said, discuss them verbally without asking for specific reports about certain things. Dr. Coop, you know the high regard in which all of us on this subcommittee hold you. And in pressing this issue, we are not doing it in any way to try to diminish that esteem. What we're trying to establish is the validity of some of the conclusions that were drawn by you or your office and the representations made by you or your office, either in the report or in the letter to the president. And again, I recollect in just a few moments ago, 
your great modesty in saying that uh, you were just a plain old doctor and these other folks here were the scientists. And, and I think that, uh, although it's overly modest, I think generally uh, you do rely on the scientific people <coughs> within the service to give you the scientific information. Isn't that correct? That's correct right. when I think I need it, sir. Right. Now, here we have some 250 studies uh, addressing to one extent or another, the issue of the psychological impact on women who have had abortions. And the conclusions which they draw uh, that in fact there is no psychological impact. For you to then say that you find those methodologically flawed I have to ask you the extent to which, in fact, you reviewed those studies. And so I ask you that. How many of those 250 studies did you read? Uh, what notes you made of it? What kind of time you devoted to it? Because, in fact, it's at the crux of the discussion that we're having as to psychological impact. Uh, I, I don't agree with you that's the crux of the situation at all, sir. Um, and I can't tell you how many I read or how much time I spent on it, but uh, let me tell you that I have been for the last 15 years very familiar with a lot of the literature uh, on both sides of the abortion issue. The things that <clears throat> I would look at as methodologically flawed and as uh, inconclusive evidence uh, would be studies that uh, only studied uh, women post-abortion for a short period of time. Because I know very well from my own experience that many of the problems that do occur after abortion and that I think do occur after abortion on the basis of what I know as a physician occur at a considerable time after abortion. I know that um, women uh, many times for uh, a period uh, that seems inordinately long to me have apparently no reaction uh, adversely to uh, the psychological effects of abortion, and then something triggers it in their mind, and uh, they become indeed severely depressed or anxious or sometimes even incapable of carrying on their work. So that I was trying, as I have through all of this study, to present material that you could rely upon and came to the conclusion we didn't have it, and that is the basis for my suggesting that we have a prospective study so that there would be absolutely no uncertainty about the conclusions drawn. Now, in the context, though, of the responses that you've given and Commander Walter has given, let me, let me quote to you the appropriate paragraph from your letter to the President. It says, today considerable attention is being paid to possible mental health effects of abortion. For example, there are almost 250 studies reported in the scientific literature which deal with the psychological aspects of abortion. All of these studies were reviewed, and the more significant studies were evaluated by staff in several of the agencies of the Public Health Service against appropriate criteria and were found to be flawed methodologically. In their view and mine, the data do not support the premise that abortion does or does not cause or contribute to psychological problems. Now, Commander Walter, you've just gotten through telling me that in fact there, were no, there was no evaluation by the agencies. The letter that Dr. Koop sent and signed says that there were, which is accurate. I don't think that's a correct uh, statement to make to Dr. Walter, Mr. Weiss. We did not say that they were not evaluated. We said we don't have any notes about the evaluation. These were discussed with people. Indeed, the agency heads from which those people came saw the final paragraph that you're referring to and did not take exception to it. Well, I, I don't want to repeat the, the verbatim or have the, the, the stenographer read back the transcript of the responses that, that you, I've gotten.
from you and from, from uh, Commander Walter, but uh, I am, I'm disturbed by what seems to be uh, a conclusive statement based on uh, evaluations of studies which turn out not to have been, or at the very least not reduced to writing, uh, discussed orally, whatever that means. Uh, Mr. Walter, do you have the names of the people at the respective agencies with whom you discussed these issues orally? Yes, sir. The people that I worked with on uh, the project within the federal agencies principally were Dr. Carol Hogue uh, at CDC, and she then has her staff at the Division of Reproductive Health, Dr. Wendy Baldwin at NICHD, and Dr. Bill Pratt at the National Centers for Health Statistics. In addition to those people I worked with, this is outside of the federal government, Dr. Henry David extensively, uh, Dr. Jackie Forrest extensively, Vince Rue, Father James Birchall, uh, who is a professor at Notre Dame, and Dr. Tom Elkin, who is a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Michigan in Ann, Ann Arbor. And they all gave you oral reports or responses or the, evaluations? The way the, the way the process worked in in um, the formulation of the draft report, as I reviewed the literature, when we started writing, uh, we then had a document um, that I circulated at some point to all of these people. I've had extensive discussions with Dr. David as a consultant, with Dr. Forrest as a consultant, and to be um, to be an accurate statement, I relied as much on their input as I did from the federal sector. But I think, to, to go back and make a distinction in the letter to the president, that we did, staff did review this, and when appropriate, the other agencies did review pieces. But not all 250. But you told me that there, were, there, were no, there was not a single written evaluation of any of those 250, is that correct? When I circulated the reports, they then made their notes. They gave me written comments on the drafts, um, but that was of the draft report, not on individual articles. Right, draft reports, such as the one that was the final report, that, that, that right? Is correct. But not on the individual 250 right. articles. Right, if, if, we, if we, or if I had made some conclusions that were inaccurate or that were possibly inflammatory or whatever it might be, we had discussions, we, they made notes, and then I worked with it. My time has expired. Let me yield at this point to Ms. Pelosi. Mr. Chairman, since I had to be out of the room, my, um, my questions related to what you were asking, I think it would be more appropriate if I read the record in it, uh, to avoid being duplicative <clears throat> of what you have already asked. I would be interested, though, to hear what Dr. Hogue's view uh, or comment of what is going on here uh, now is. Uh, Dr. Hogue, would you comment on um, the report? In what respect, Congresswoman? In every respect. Dr. Hogue, you heard Mr. Wal Mr. Walter uh, lead off with your name of the list of people at the respective agencies with whom we discussed these 250 articles. And my question, and, and, and Ms. Pelosi's question is, what in fact did you do? How many of the reports did you read? Did you assign them to other people to read the articles, 250 articles? Were there written evaluations made of them? How was that process handled? Is that the, the question, Ms. Pelosi? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I would agree with the process as, Dr. Uh, as Mr. Walter um, um, reviewed and summarized the process. Well, if, if, with, with all due respect, Dr. Hope, I'd like to know specifically what, which of the reports, did you read any of the reports, the articles? Did you read any of the articles? Yes, sir, but I cannot give you um, exactly which articles I read. Uh, I would be glad to supply that for the record if you'd like. Did you make notes when you read those articles? I probably did, but I uh, certainly did not 
uh, write a formal um, uh, evaluation of them, nor did any of my staff. We were not asked to do that. We did respond orally to uh, uh, requests and um, did review drafts of the, of the draft report. Well, I would, I would appreciate for the record of the subcommittee's hearing from you and from you, Commander Walter, uh, all the records of conversations or discussions that you had with one another or with other people within the various agencies about these 250 articles whatever notes you may have made about them, and so on. Hey? Sir, we, I'm sorry, I don't have notes like that. I don't maintain notes like that. Whatever you have in relation to it, which would ref refresh your recollection and, and provide additional information to the subcommittee as to the extent to which those 250 articles were reviewed. Okay? Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you for yielding to me, Ms. Pelosi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question, uh, next question is for Dr. Reed, and it really isn't necessarily about That's the right. report, if we make, uh, Dr. Reed, is there any plan for a comprehensive system uh, for collecting data on abortion or on morbidity of, preg and, of pregnancy outcomes? No, I, I'm sorry. It's is there any comprehensive plan for collecting statistics? Uh, the Centers for Disease Control collect uh, reports of abortions from all states. Um, from 44 states in 1985, we received uh, reports from the state health agencies, and from the other states, we received reports um, from abortion providers. We publish uh, data on the numbers of abortions reported and on the characteristics of women obtaining abortions. This has been an ongoing surveillance system since 1969. In addition, we collect information on all deaths reported to us related to abortion. We have done that since 1972. We publish data analyzing those deaths and um, making recommendations on how to improve abortion safety. Do you also collect data on uh more deaths related to pregnancy? Yes, ma'am. And uh, we began in 1979 uh, investigating all deaths related to ectopic pregnancy. Uh, beginning in um, the last year, we have begun um, death investigations of all pregnancy related deaths. Uh, that is all deaths uh, from 1987 on. Retrospectively, we have collected information from vital records, and um, both for the death and uh, in the case since 1979, of any uh, related documents such as a birth certificate for uh, women who have died uh, during pregnancy or within one year following pregnancy. Have you drawn any conclusions or comparisons uh, uh, that might be useful? Uh, the uh, number of abortion uh, deaths per 100,000 abortions, um, we do report. We also report uh, deaths related to other pregnancy outcomes. Um, and um, in 1985, there were six <coughs> deaths re reported to us related to induced abortion. Uh, this represents about one death per 200,000 abortions. Uh, in the same year, in um, the, uh, there were 295 maternal deaths reported to the National Center for Health Statistics, and um, I also have some concern about the 250 reports, but I will uh, look for the information that <clears throat> is sent to the chairman um, by those who uh, reviewed them and I think it should answer my concerns, hopefully, at that time. I just have a, a question regarding, you talked about uh, ab abortion-related deaths. Uh, do you have any kind of statistics that uh, would uh, indicate the number of, uh, of deaths related to abortions prior to the time of legalized abortion? Did, were any uh, records kept of that? The same kind of records that are kept now, uh, that is, reports on death certificates of um, abortion-related deaths, both spontaneous and induced abortions. Um, 
in a situation in which uh, abortion is illegal, uh, it's important to look at all abortion, uh, spontaneous abortion related deaths as well because there is some um, <coughs> unknown number of those deaths that are related to illegal induced abortions. Uh, the woman uh, was not known to have had an induced abortion, but the circumstances around the abortion would be um, of the reported spontaneous abortion would be thought to probably have been induced. So a proper comparison over time would be uh, lumping all abortion-related deaths, miscarriage-related, induced abortion that is legal and induced abortion that is illegal. That's about the only way that you can compare across time uh, when uh, before 1973 and after 1973. Um, in the decades prior to 1970, uh, say from 1940 on, uh, total abortions uh, contributed somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of all maternal deaths. Um, since 1980, they have contributed uh, around 5 percent of all uh, uh, pregnancy-related deaths reported to the National Center for Health Statistics. Thank you. I have no other question. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. Dr. Coop, Commander Walter, in the draft report, it is stated that, quote, abortions resulting from rape or incest or from genetic defects or other health-related reasons are not considered in the context of this report. Why would those be excluded? Initially, um, that language was not in there. I believe it was in a review session with uh, Dr. Hogue, Baldwin, and Pratt in early December uh, of, of 88. We were reviewing the draft. We decided that it would be appropriate to include that language because these, uh, the women who were either victims of rape incest or had genetic problems associated with the fetus were in a separate category that um, did not, their situation was not resultant upon their behavior. Principally in looking at the unintended pregnancy, there were behavioral problems associated with the pregnancy or to some extent women who had had um, contraceptive device failures would also fall in that category, but that's why they were excluded because that was not considered that the circumstances uh, warranted them being included. included. Well, I agree with you that, that their reactions uh, uh, to abortion and to unwanted pregnancy could be different, uh, both in <coughs> inception and, and in motivation, but uh, when compared to other women with unplanned pregnancies. And that research would be needed to determine what those reactions are. Would you agree with our previous witnesses that carrying those types of unwanted pregnancies to term <coughs> are likely to cause more distress to the woman than having an abortion? I would think so. I would agree with them. Earlier this morning, Dr. Nancy Adler testified about the findings of the upcoming report of the American Psychological Association, which concludes that the weight of evidence supports the conclusion that severe long-term psychological effects of abortion are rare. Uh, Dr. Coop, what is your opinion of that conclusion? Uh, I don't think that you can answer these questions, sir. I wouldn't have answered the question Dr. Walter answered the same way. As I sat behind the previous panel, I heard them talk about biases and the fact that it was very hard to eliminate biases from other people's work, but they were introducing their own biases into their comments to you. And I think that is the great problem when you discuss abortion. It is very difficult to separate what you believe about abortion, the moral issue, from what you talk about when you talk about health issues. And I don't think that you can answer a question that says what would have happened if we didn't do it because you did do it and therefore you can't know what would happen if you didn't do it. So I think one has to be very careful to uh, make those conclusions. I think one of the things that I tried to imply before is that if you study abortion the way many people have uh, and see how well women feel about uh, their decision 
uh, three months after that, the uh, actual procedure, uh, one can be very badly misled. And that's one of the reasons why I said that in reviewing the literature, there is some that you just toss out because they haven't been done completely enough. Um, in my own experience, as I also said, uh, many people that I have counseled in days gone by have gone for years before they suddenly were overwhelmed by one thing or another, usually guilt, uh, about what they have done. Let me give you one example. Uh, I know of a woman who uh, just before her menopause became pregnant. She already had uh, teenage children and without notifying her husband or them, she obtained an abortion, was very relieved to be free of that pregnancy and lived her life quite well until her oldest daughter, some seven or eight years later, presented her with her first grandchild. And that's when she had her tremendous reaction. She reached out to take her child, couldn't do so, and went into a severe depression, and then the whole thing unfolded. And um, that is why I think one has to be very careful about saying, well, we studied these people for, th for three months and six months, and everybody's okay. Uh, and yet, uh, the that Dr. Adler's conclusion, or the, or the report, the American Psychological Association conclusion, uh, that severe long-term psychological effects of abortion are rare, seems to be consistent with your remarks at several meetings on this topic in which you refer to the psychological problem as, quote, minuscule from a public health perspective. From a public health perspective, that's true. From the personal perspective, from the family perspective, it's overwhelming. All this leads up to my conclusion to the president that we don't know what we're talking about, and if you want to know what we're talking about and feel certain about what you're saying, you have to do a prospective study scientifically, statistically, and with proper controls. In the draft report is also stated, quote, uh, women seriously distressed over their pregnancies need access to competent and sympathetic counseling about the availability of legally, medically, ethically, and socially unencumbered alternatives, close quote. Uh, it's also emphasized in that report that for the need for unbiased, accurate information in counseling, and you, you suggested that in your testimony, Dr. Coop, uh, do you have any suggestions about how access to accurate, unbiased information could be improved? Uh, very difficult, again, because, as I said, um, it's very difficult to separate one's um, advice to uh, a woman who is in the midst of an unplanned, unwanted pregnancy and uh, keep your own personal bias about uh, the social aspects of abortion out of it. And uh, as we went over, uh, this situation in talking uh, with uh, the women that we consulted with who felt that they had been mistreated, felt that their present psychological problems were associated with abortion. Um, one of the things that I think was consistent with all of them is that they felt that they had not had unbiased uh, counseling. And uh, I have known of counselors on both sides uh, of the abortion issue that I think uh, in improperly advise uh, their um, clients because it's very difficult if you feel strongly for or against abortion to present a perfectly neutral option uh, to a distressed uh, woman uh, who has a pregnancy that she doesn't want. Uh, how you overcome that uh, is difficult because it's human nature and I don't know how you can beat it. In an earlier draft of the report, it was also stated that women have the right to make a decision about an unwanted pregnancy after receiving, quote, unimpeded access to care and the privacy of the doctor-patient relationship, close quote. Do you agree with that statement? Well, it's Mr. Walter's statement. Um, do you want to answer that? I agree with it. How about you, Dr. Coop? <laughs> How about you, Dr. Coop? Do you agree with the statement? You talk to me, sir? Yes. The, re the report aside, do you Re read it statement? to me again? It says, unimpeded access to care and the privacy of the doctor patient re relationship uh, is that, that women should have the right to make a decision about an unwanted pregnancy after receiving uh, 
that unimpeded access to care and the privacy of the doctor-patient relationship. Well, it's the law of the land. So you she has that it? right. She already has that right. And you agree with it? Well, it's the law of the land. I'm not against the law. Okay. Uh, from a public health point of view, uh, as distinguished from a personal point of view, and I think that you have been remarkable in being able to, in a whole series of controversial uh, uh, undertakings, to put aside your personal view and to address public health concerns. Do you think that poor women, including those on Medicaid, have unbiased and, un and unimpeded access to care and the privacy of the doctor-patient relationship when they need to make a decision about an unwanted pregnancy? Well, I can easily answer that question, sir, because I've discussed it many times from uh, Pody around the country. Uh, the problems of poverty, uh, of isolation, of lack of access to ordinary medical care, uh, such as one finds in the group that I think you're referring to, uh, is deplorable and should not exist in our kind of a society. Would that unimpeded access to care... Uh, my time is up. Uh, Ms. Pelosi? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have just a couple clarifications. Um, this is really a very important hearing, and I'm very grateful to you for having it, especially in this timely fashion before the Supreme Court will be making its decision. Dr. Coop mentioned that he's not against the law of the land. Is the President of the United States against the law of the land, Dr. Coop? I, my position, uh, perhaps a poor choice of words, my position is well known to everybody in this country about abortion. I'm opposed to it. Uh, but I also took an oath of office to uphold the law of the land, and that's what I do in this job, and that's why I try to walk a tightrope and present a report such as I have, okay. and that's why I think it's free of my pro-life bias. I believe that you are sincere in trying to, to help alleviate the situation, as you just testified, in terms of the statement that uh, Chairman Weiss mentioned about poor people, et cetera. It's you know, I know we're trying to stick to the report and the psychological, the scientific That's the methodology. That's we're making, yes. But I cannot, I, I, I cannot separate it from the reality of life, which is as follows. We're talking about your unwillingness to support a statement that uh, Mr. Walter proposed because we cannot say that, well, you know what you said about it. Now, why should we be trying to decide that the, the decision of a woman to make an abortion, to have an abortion, should be free of all consequences whatsoever. Every decision that we make in life has its consequences. We weigh it, the pluses, the minuses. And all of a sudden, abortion has to stand up to a test where there is no after effect, where there is no psychological um, sadness or whatever years later at the sight of a new baby in the family, etc. And I don't know of any other decision uh, that is subjected to that kind of scrutiny. Certainly there is a downside. Uh, that, that's why it's a, a, a decision. And in light of the fact that uh, some of the testimony we've heard where our previous panel members of the, the pro-life uh, contingent uh, were testifying that if we didn't, if abortions were not legal, there would be fewer abortions because the law would teach. Well, you know, around here there's an expression, you can teach it both ways. I don't agree even that you can teach it both ways, but uh, obviously we differ on that. But the fact is, is that people with resources will have their right to choice in this country or another country. And isn't it, doesn't it come down to some kind of fairness when we're talking about all of this psychological... We don't want people intimidated into having abortions. We don't want people intimidated into not having abortions. That intimidation has no role, I don't think, uh, in exercising the right of choice. And, and I guess another comment I would make, since you brought up an anecdote about a, a, a patient who, at the sight of a granddaughter or grandchild years later, felt this remorse. Um, this was a grown woman with children, a mature married woman who made a decision it's not without its consequences. Did you imply by that that she would rather have had the baby and, 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 and raised it or that 
this was one of the downsides of it. I didn't understand the point, frankly. I, I never make implications about what somebody else thinks because I don't know, ma'am. But I mean, you used it as an example of... I used it as an example to show the chairman that there were late effects of abortion. Okay. That's all I was trying to do. Okay, well, now, this is within the context of the whole issue of choice. And, for example, when we had the, our ongoing debate on the floor of the appropriations, I think it was for the District of Columbia, made in that context, I believe it was, one of our colleagues gave an example, one of our male colleagues gave an example of the fact that there was a rape mm -hmm. to, for somebody close to him and his family. And of course they were faced with this dilemma. But it was okay because it turns out that the young lady was not pregnant. But it was even more okay because she had already decided that she would have had the baby if she were pregnant. Now, for some reason, it was okay to decide for her, but it wouldn't be okay to decide if you were without the resources to exercise a decision or to, uh, to have every medical option available. It never occurred to him that as he was celebrating her decision, he was stating that she made a decision and one that might not be available uh, to a poor person for the very, because of what he was arguing in that debate, which was that there should be no funding in case of rape or incest. One of our other colleagues proposed that if a woman is a poor woman is at home in her house with her husband in her home, um, a, a murder someone breaks in, murders the husband, rapes her. By the book, she's supposed to have that baby. When asked, when we asked our colleagues, should she have this baby? Is this not enough of a case for funding to be available for this woman to have an abortion? No, she should have the baby because some good may come of it. Now, I think there might be some serious psychological effects on a woman who has the baby of her husband's murderer. And while we're talking anecdotally, uh, that is a, something that could happen to someone. So I don't think that we can isolate how we discuss, although, as I say, I'm not particularly um, pleased with the number of abortions that take place in the country, and I think we've got to do something to educate the public to diminish the number for all kinds of reasons. I guess I get back to my original point, which is in making these studies, and, and I think, uh, Mr. Walter, uh, I, I appreciate your recommendation, and I wish it had been the recommendation of the Surgeon General, but I hope that we don't try to do studies that say, under any circumstances, there, uh, there, are, no, um, uh, there are no large number of women who don't have some regrets about having to face this decision, because I don't think we'll ever conclude that that is not the case. It is a decision, it's an important decision, it's a traumatic decision, it is not without its consequences, as is every other decision uh, that we make. I'm not a scientist, I'm not even a doctor, I'm not even a lawyer. But I do think uh, that this is a very human problem, and, it, and to, the, effect, to the, um, the extent that these things are not unrelated in terms of the attitude of government to make every available option that is legally available and um, and in some cases, um, the funding available, uh, I think that we cannot uh, understate the fact that, yes, there are, going to be, there are going to be some psychological problems with it. So I wish that, rather than by implication, there would be a stronger role on the part of those who are responsible for public policy to come forward and put this in a, in a context, again, respecting everyone's uh, religious opinion on it, but, in, uh, but recognizing the fact that uh, uh, we have to help people make their decision, not contribute to their psychological uh, difficulties that they have with the decision. I have no questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Un unless the Surgeon General would like to comment on, uh, on your comments, and you're free to do so. I, w I was paying very close attention to see if there was a question mark in there, and when there wasn't, I said nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I said I didn't have a question. All right. Thank you. Mr. Payne? Just basically, I think the Surgeon General indicated that there is a, it's a abomination as relates to the quality of health care for, for the uh, poor in the country. And that um, certainly is something that I hope that we will be able to take a look at in this, uh, this kinder and gentler administration, the, the question of um, uh, there is a great deal of, of support for the right to lifers, and that's great. 
Um, but in many instances, when we need to have um, dollars to then provide for health care for, for uh, inner city children, we find that uh, you're told to read lips and wealthy people don't want to pay any more taxes. And so I'm confused as it relates to that. Uh, and the question of AIDS, as we've mentioned, the uh, 81, it was $200,000. Now it's $1.6 which is a big increase. But I still feel that uh, as it relates to that problem of health care, it's certainly just a drop in the bucket if we're really going to go about trying to uh, come up with a, a, uh, a solution to the problem. Uh, and I finally am confused when it comes to emergencies where the uh, SNL bailout immediately became a $200 billion piece that will be met. And we're still talking about uh, one billion dollar uh, assessment to uh, to deal with something uh, like uh, AIDS uh, and some of the other uh, health care. So I, I hope that perhaps in this next uh, four years we can work towards together shifting some of the, uh, the priorities where we can really deal with some of these uh, the human uh, misery that we find uh, here in this country. Even the infant mortality rate if we took the if we took the minority community alone by itself, we would uh, be 28th in the world as it relates to infant mortality, and that uh, makes no sense. I really have no question either, just a statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Uh, Dr. Coop, getting back to uh, the sense that you had that there should be unimpeded access to care and to accurate, unbiased information, would that access be impeded if women, cons in your opinion, if women considering abortions knew that getting an abortion would require her to travel long, dis long distances to other communities or states where it was available and that the procedure would be less safe if travel arrangements caused delays in having the operation? Again, can't answer that till you see, but uh, the way you phrased the question, um, uh, probably the more difficult it is to do anything, the harder it is to accomplish it. Again, in your opinion, from a public health point of view, disregarding both your personal opposition to abortion and your support of civil liberties, might it impair women's access to medical treatment and the privacy of the doctor-patient relationship if the clinic that she is using is surrounded by protesting individuals calling her a murderer? Uh, certainly would be upsetting. Uh, again, no studies have ever been done about what uh, people feel about that. Some people that I have known who've gone through such lines uh, pass it off as nothing. Um, it's a question that uh, requires um, uh, prophetic foresight, and although I have a beard, I never have um, really taken on the role of a prophet. I don't know. And yet in your meeting with representatives from the American Council on Science and Health, you stated that if a counselor was to equate abortion with murder, that would have negative psychological consequences for a woman who decided to have an abortion. Isn't that situation somewhat similar? Well, I think I said that in the context of counseling. Um, right. I have known counselors uh, who uh, were very much uh, in favor of um, influencing an unwanted uh, pregnancy uh, to go to conclusion. And uh, in their frustration uh, about not having been able to sell their point of view, uh, have uh, emotionally blurted out, well, if you want to murder your child, okay. And that's what I was discussing right. with that particular group, saying that uh, you'd have to make a whole, if you did a decent study on this subject, you would have to divide all of the categories of women into two additional categories, those that got good counseling and those that didn't, because it would certainly affect what happened to them down the road. In your letter to President Reagan, you suggested, and, and you referred to it in the course of your testimony today, that a major study be conducted to assess the psychological impact of pregnancy, abortion, miscarriage, and infertility. Now, how could such research 
be used to help make policy decisions regarding health care for women? Well, we don't know. The thing that one of the things that has always surprised me, considering how long women have been having babies, that we don't know much about the outcome of mating. Uh, we make a lot of um, decisions about it. Uh, we have policy based upon small studies. Uh, we uh, make decisions on what we think would happen. But we've never taken a large group of women and followed the results of their mating. Which ones became pregnant? Of those who became pregnant, which ones planned it? Which ones did not plan it but wanted it? Which ones didn't plan it but didn't want it? What was the support of the sexual partner? Was it uh, supportive or was it uh, derogatory? Um, what did they think about possible outcomes? What kind of counseling did they get? If you work that out, sir, you can come down to 64 classes of women who have different outcomes of mating. And uh, that's why the study is so extraordinarily complicated. But added to that is the problem that if you compare what we think are the statistics for abortion, as compiled the way uh, Dr. Hogue pointed out, with what we know from questionnaires to women about when they had abortions and how many, there's a tremendous discrepancy. Only about half of the women who've had abortions will acknowledge it uh, on a questionnaire. So that as kind of a study that we, uh, that I suggested be done to the president uh, has first of all to tackle that uh, subject of denial so that uh, you don't get an interpretation of that denial uh, biased, as you heard in the last panel. Two different, two different investigators of great reputation uh, had different points of view about why people deny uh, the fact that they've had an abortion. And that has to be overcome first, and uh, we are indeed working on an instrument that might be able to ferret out a more accurate number of women who did indeed acknowledge having an abortion. In your letter to the President in discussing <coughs> to your proposal for this kind of study, uh, you said that the most, I'm quoting now, the most desirable prospective study could be conducted for approximately a hundred million dollars over the next five years. A less expensive yet satisfactory study could be conducted for approximately ten million dollars over the same period of time. Uh, in discussions that you had, we've had with people you suggested at times that an excellent study would cost perhaps as much as a, a billion dollars. Now, it seems difficult to determine reasonable scientific standards in this kind of research. Do you have any concerns that a $10 million study would also be methodologically flawed as have the other studies that we've referred to in the course of today's hearing? Well, I don't intend to have any part in such a study, but if I did, I would not undertake it if I thought it could be criticized eventually as being methodologically flawed. And that's why we are right now, even though no one has suggested that we proceed with such a study, we are approaching the first barrier, which is to get rid of that problem of the discrepancy in numbers. Now, would you know, if, if, and if you, you do, can you tell us why the president ask you to submit this, to, to undertake this study and to submit this report, is it safe to assume that the president's expectation, based on some staff suggestions or recommendations to him in the White House, was that this report could help <coughs> overturn Roe against Wade by documenting the not negative impact of abortion? I stated in my letter to the President that there were those around him who had advised him that such was the case. I think I used the word falsely or erroneously. Um, you might wonder how I know that. I know it only by the um, statement of the person who advised him. And um, it was incorrect advice for the President, and uh, I'm sorry he was misled to think that uh, something as complicated could be satisfied uh, in so short a time uh, by such a, uh, a study. Uh, in your meeting with the American Council on Science and Health, you stated that an honest report would not be, quote, a weapon against abortion. Yet in your letter to President Reagan, you stated that it was unclear whether abortion causes physical harm to the mother, such as infertility and miscarriage. 
Now, that statement is not consistent with the report or with your testimony today. And it concerns me that until today, this has been the public statement that's been carried while the report has not been public. Can you explain that inconsistency? No, what I, what I mean by the term unclear there is that it is known that following abortion, certain things happen. Uh, but it is also known that those certain things happen in women who have carried a pregnancy to term and it is also known that those things happen in people who've never been pregnant. So you cannot pinpoint them scientifically, statistically, with control studies and say, because this woman had an abortion, she did this, because other people who didn't have abortion also do the same thing. Dr. Reed, uh, it has been more than five years since the CDC has published data comparing the mortality associated with abortion with mortality associated with childbirth. The CDC still publishes, publishes mortality data from abortion, but makes no comparisons. Why aren't those comparisons published anymore? Dr. Hogue? Sir, the data speak for themselves. Um, data are published on maternal mortality. Data are published on abortion mortality. But they used to be published by way of comparison, isn't that correct? Those statements were made, yes. The comparisons were made? Yes, sir. But they're not anymore? They could still be made by anyone uh, looking at the data. Yes, I know that, but CDC doesn't do it. And what I'm asking you is, why isn't that being done anymore? What, was there a decision, a conscious decision made not to do that? And why? I wasn't in a policy position, um, Congressman. I'm not really aware of, of any policy. Well, would you, for the, for the record, give us the institutional response, please? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Pelosi? I have no questions. Yes. Thank you. I'm still I'm re rereading the letter. Good. <laughs> uh, in 1982, uh, Dr. Reed, uh, Dr. Ward Cates, Deputy Director of the Family Planning Evaluation Dis Division and former Chief of the Abortion Surveillance Activities at CDC was transferred to the Sexually Transmitted Disease Division. In an article that appeared at the time, it was stated that this transfer occurred after Dr. Cates had been, quote, under criticism within the Reagan administration for his excellent work in analyzing data from the Abortion Surveillance Survey, close quote. Earlier this morning, Dr. David Grimes, formerly of CDC, stated that the transfer was made for political reasons. Would you care to comment on that? No, I wouldn't. Uh, I wasn't here then, and I really don't know anything about that, Congressman. Dr. Grimes gave several examples of apparent censorship of research at CDC because of his views on abortions. Under what conditions are political or religious ideology <clears throat> considered relevant to presentation or publication of research data today? I don't think that's important. We ask our scientists to be competent scientists and collect data, and uh, I've not been called upon by anyone to uh, uh, limit the uh, one's interest in a particular subject or a particular outcome. If he does good science, why, well, to my knowledge, he's encouraged. There's a big shortage of scientists. When Right to Life leaders were invited to meet with CDC researchers and officials in the summer of 1986 regarding research on the physical impact of abortion on women, did that group that is the group of, of Right to Life people, include scientists? Do you know what the purpose of that meeting was? I have no idea. Dr. Hogue? I wasn't at that meeting, sir. No. Can you tell us whether similar meetings were held with scientists or advocates who support a woman's right to choose abortion? No, we indicated that uh, we would be available for meeting with people uh, in any, we're always available for meeting with people who are interested in talking about our work. Um, 
I gather from your responses that you're, you are, you're not aware of any, any religious or ideological beliefs interfering with scientific research, and I would hope that, uh, in fact, that would be carried through, regardless of the strong beliefs of the members of the Reagan and Bush administration regarding abortion, so that uh, the integrity of research on women's health when controversial issues are involved is maintained. What can we do to help assure that that, that is the case, Dr. Reed? In regard to women's issues? Yeah, right. Uh, well, I certainly think there need to be more research on women's issues. Uh, and I have had no instructions not to encourage that in any way. I think that abortion is an important topic and it deserves study. I also uh, think that we have another list of priorities before us and uh, we have a restricted budget and, and we have to make those priorities as much as possible. Right now, AIDS is the number one priority because it threatens all of us, not just half the population, but all of us. And uh, I think it's fortunate that there is some uh, evidence coming out of uh, our studies on AIDS about sexual behavior and so forth, and uh, I encourage that sort of thing. Dr. Hogue, there are several potentially important research questions pertaining to access to abortion for poor women and the impact of restrict restricted access on maternal and child health. Does the CDC conduct research on those issues? No, at the moment uh, we are conducting um, surveillance of um, abortion and we are conducting a case control study of ectopic pregnancy uh, with uh, looking at a variety of potential risk factors including abortion. What kind of information did the CB CDC abortion surveillance project collect and disseminate in the early 1980s and what does it do now? I'd be glad to uh, submit a bibliography of our publications for the record. And the nature of the work that it's doing now by comparison. Would you submit that to us too? I would be glad to submit um, the, what we are doing. Uh, I'm not quite sure of what you're asking in, in the second part of your question. Well, I'm, I'm trying to see what the change in focus, if any, has been uh, of the CDC abortion surveillance project. The major change in focus uh, between 1978, when the last study of abortion morbidity was performed, um, the large-scale study, and now, is that recognizing that the morbidity related to abortion was very well known, very well documented, um, we shifted priorities to try to develop that kind of knowledge and documentation for morbidity related to childbirth. We've been attempting to do that, uh, and um, our uh, work in that area has grown over the period of the 1980s. Our research results on the medical effects of abortion that are from other countries or from the United States more than 10 to 15 years ago, relevant to current abortions. I think it depends on the uh, type of research that you're talking about and on the, um, the uh, way that that research was conducted. Dr. Alexander, earlier this morning, one of our witnesses, Dr. Forrest, testified about the large number of unwanted pregnancies in the United States every year. She quoted research indicating that a major research a reason is lack of enthusiasm for existing contraceptives. What is NICHD doing to develop new contraceptives or improve existing ones? The NICHD is the major focus of the federal government's and in fact the world's uh, efforts in development of new contraceptives. We've had a contraceptive development activity and a branch of, by that name since the establishment of the Center for Population Research. Uh, in 1986, we de launched a particular initiative, a, a contraceptive development initiative, to try and encourage further the development of, of new and improved contraceptive techniques, along with studies in the basic uh, sciences of reproduction, uh, studies evaluating the use of various contraceptive agents for safety and accuracy and effectiveness, 
as well as behavioral studies related to the use or non-use of contraception. Uh, during that, that in ensuing years, that program has grown, and uh, currently the contraceptive development branch spends about $9.5 million annually in contraceptive development research. I know that NICHD has a limited budget, and there are many important research issues under your jurisdiction. We've discussed some of these issues at previous hearings, and I've tried to make my support for your efforts very clear. What kinds of research in initiatives is NICHD planning in the area of responsible reproductive behavior or other areas pertaining to reducing unwanted pregnancies? And if your budget was more generous, what would be a cost-effective use of federal funds to expand those initiatives? Many of those uh, activities relate not just to contraception, to uh, human sexuality, but to AIDS efforts as well. For example, uh, in line with what Dr. Koop was discussing in terms of sex education, uh, we have funded a, uh, an effort with the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, jointly with the Bureau of Maternal and Child Health, to work in developing age-appropriate educational materials and activities uh, for the pediatrician or, or health care provider to work with in, at, at various ages in, with the child and the family in the office or clinic setting uh, in terms of education about human sexuality, uh, developing that concept on into uh, sexual activity and contraceptive use as the age appropriateness indicates. We also have uh, studies related to uh, decisions on use or non-use of contraceptives, particularly focusing on teenagers, as well as uh, reasons for initiating sexual activity. We are also developing studies related to teenage pregnancy and attempts to avoid that, ranging from uh, sex education through uh, postponing sexual involvement types of ac activities to uh, contraceptive use. Does NICHD plan to issue some requests for proposals that are directly relevant to reducing unwanted pregnancies, such as proposals to develop contraceptives or increase the correct use of contraceptives? We do that constantly in the area of contraceptive development. Uh, much of the other research that we have uh, supported uh, through issuance of RFAs has related, to, again, to gaining understanding uh, for why why and when uh, teenagers particularly initiate sexual activity and the reasons for their uh, risk-taking behavior and the reasons for their use and non-use of contraceptives. Dr. Reed, I wonder if you'd comment, uh, because I think that uh, in your statement you were uh, somewhat vague, although the suggestion I got was that you had some questions about the extent of the study that you could undertake uh, of the kind that Dr. Koop proposes for $10 million. What, what's your view as to the, the feasibility of, of undertaking that kind of broad, comprehensive study and what, what it would take to uh, really do it effectively from a monetary point of view? Although I have done research in the past, uh, and I've even done a little bit of uh, social science research, uh, most of my time has been spent practicing medicine for 35 years. Uh, I do know, how, and so I can't exactly say what that's going to cost without relying on some of the experts around me. And even they, I think, are unsure of how much it's going to cost, but it seems to me as if it's an extremely complex sort of thing. Trying to attribute the effects to any particular cause in any particular situation is very difficult when it has to do with psychology and there's so many other variables as well. Uh, and it, from what I hear from Dr. Koop and my own experience, uh, uh, those psychological effects might turn up at a much later date. It would seem that it would have to be a very long-term study it would have to be very complex, and the controls would be very difficult to obtain. Putting a dollar value on it, I couldn't begin to do that, but uh, certainly $10 million does not seem to be 
an exceptional amount of money, and, and I would think it would be a good deal more than that. Um, I think that you're probably the correct person to ask this. I've seen the statistics, and I don't remember them off the top of my head. Do you have the percentage of uh, teenage sexual activity? What percentage of teenagers by what age are engaged in sec sexual activity? I have seen those figures. Do we have, do we have those yeah. here? The NICHD has funded several studies uh, over the course of, of the years that have followed the patterns of, of teen sexual activity and initiation of that activity by age. Uh, clearly, that uh, pattern of teen sexual activity uh, went up during the uh, night, late 1970s and early 1980s. It appears now from our latest survey data that that is leveling off. Uh, At what percentage? It, it varies by age, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> percent of adolescents sexually active in 1982, uh, total at all ages now, uh, total about 42.8 percent. That clearly is much higher at the higher ages and, and lower around 15. Yeah, my, my recollection, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is that by the age of 17, roughly 70% of teenagers are engaged in sexual activity, and that by the age of 19, it is somewhere in excess of 80%. Does that strike a responsive chord with you? Those figures are close. Uh, they, they vary uh, by geographic location. Males initiate earlier and, and have a higher frequency at all ages, uh, but those figures are not are probably a good overall estimate. Yeah, and, and the reason that I, I wanted to bring that out is because I think that it underscores again the point that so many of the witnesses, and most especially Dr. Coop, has been making about the importance of education on sexual activity and on contraceptive behavior if in fact people are going to engage, young people are going to engage in sexual activity. Um, and I'm, again, I think that uh, that Dr. Coop, that you play a very uh, positive role in, in continuing to stress the importance of education of all kinds. And uh, I would hope that there would be greater attention paid uh, to the comments that, and, and, the, and the efforts that you are making. I want to thank all of you for, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Ms. Pelosi. <laughs> I have just another brief question, Mr. Chairman, in relationship to the report and following up on your question. And then I do want to join you in thanking our witnesses for their very fine testimony. And again, I hope that the good work that is being done on AIDS will have an impact on some kind of uh, communication with our children and all um, those who are concerned about sexual activity. 80% at age 19 as a mother of five children. I find that rather staggering. But in any case, um, Doctor, uh, Mr. Walter, when we were talking about your report, et cetera, uh, I wanted to call to your attention and remind you that a number of times in the course of the day, we've heard that 50% uh, of the women asked if they've had an abortion say they don't have an abortion. And the implication in that is, to me, and maybe it's incorrect, is that there's some kind of guilt, uh, um, denial, whatever. But the fact is, is that, that uh, while it may not scientifically have revealed itself in some of your studies, uh, some empirical knowledge that women have talking to each other is that frankly many women don't even want their families to know. They admit it to themselves. They just don't want their families to know for whatever reason. The fragility of their, the, the condition of their marriage, the condition of their health, not life death threatening, but any medication they may have taken, the, their own age, the number of children that they have. For whatever reasons, uh, they make a personal private decision and uh, maybe they think that if they tell somebody else it might get back to their children in a way that they would not like them to know because uh, uh, it, as you know it has a traumatic effect uh, it could have depending on what your yeah. studies show so uh, do, do you find that that the denial is denial to oneself or for a wide range of reasons uh, no one knows all one knows is that the statistic is reported that way uh, mm -hmm. why they do not report it is absolutely unknown to my knowledge. Um, it's well, a very private, it's a very personal, and it's very unknown. 
Dr. Koop, then in light of that, in your suggestion to go forward with an appropriate prospective <coughs> study, is it ever possible to get the, uh, the kind of information that you want if this 50% rate of denial is, um, is true? We've been working on that since uh, the 10th of January. Um, people who understand uh, the way an instrument is designed in order to get the truth. Um, you must remember that all the things that we've said about that are uh, perfectly private and uh, they should not be shared with anyone other than uh, a statistical number. So when women refuse to give that information, in spite of the fact that it'll never be known that they did, mm -hmm. it is a very serious problem. So I guess part of your job, and as, as, as those who are professionals at putting these instruments of measuring uh, thinking together, uh, the confidentiality would be absolutely extraordinarily important in order to get some, some, true, uh, some true data. I, if, you, if you're able to accomplish that, I would commend you because uh, I, we had a confidential survey around here recently was in the paper a few weeks later, right. but uh, hopefully uh, the, the confidence and the sincerity of the effort uh, that there is no foregone conclusion that, that you're trying to draw, but that it's, it's, the truth is necessary to draw the, uh, the logical scientific conclusion will be transmitted to the public should you get the funding uh, to have this, uh, this study. Well, there's no point in going forward with a study if that uh, barrier isn't eliminated because the results would not be worth anything. No, that's, I understand. Thank you, Dr. Coop, Mr. Walters, Dr. Hogue, Dr. Reed, Dr. Alexander. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Mr. Pelosi. Uh, and let me again, in conclusion, express my appreciation to all of you for participating in what I think a number of the witnesses have acknowledged uh, to be very important hearings. I think important uh, from our perspective and yours and the public's perspective because, as you've indicated, you've been unhappy about some of the characterizations that have appeared in the press about the letter itself. Uh, there have been people who've been unhappy on both sides about uh, your characterization of the, of the report, and it seems to me that the most uh, constructive thing that we can do is, in fact, to let the report uh, speak for itself as we try to do as amplified by the testimony that we've heard today and that within that context, regardless of what the original motivation of President Reagan's advisors may have been, I think perhaps a significant public service will have been performed. Again, I thank you very much, Dr. Coop and the rest of the witnesses for the public health service. Thank you so much. The subcommittee now stands adjourned subject to the call of the chair. <coughs>